All right, stream starting. Stream number seven or eight? Stream eight? I've done eight streams already. Wow. All right. Hello. I'm building a keyboard. These are going to be the controllers on the left and right sides of my new keyboard. I'm going to be doing a split keyboard. Not unlike this corn keyboard that I have, where the left, the right, and the left both have controllers, and there's this little cable that goes between them called the TRRS cable. And we're going to set that up right now in our custom one. So I have this controller. You can think of it as the one on the left-hand side of the keyboard connected to the com my computer via this USB cable on the left there. Then I have this controller representing the right half of the keyboard. The goal for today is to connect the left and the right halves and have them talk to each other. Um, ultimately, it would be cool if I could get the left one to program the right one. That would be awesome. But I would settle with the two halves just knowing which sides they are and being able to exchange messages. That would be cool enough. So here I have the pinout. I need this because I need to connect first the grounds of the two together and then the 3.3 .3 volts. And uh, spoiler, I already did this before the stream to make sure it actually works and actually loaded the same program I've been working on onto the right controller, which I just got set up here. So what I expect if I, as long as I recreate what I did about an hour ago, is this one should start blinking as soon as I hook it up to that one. I'm going to be connecting the ground in 3.3 .3, and I think I'm going to be connecting these two data lines, the ones that are um, the TX and RX0 for UART. And then we'll have my software set up to configure those two pins as a UART. And I suppose we'll just do a, like a loopback. So everything we receive on the RX will just send back to the TX. And then as a test, we'll just have the left side just um, send something to the right side and try to see if it echoes something back. Since we only have a USB on one side, we're only going to be able to see the log for one side. And um, it just occurred to me that since I don't have this one programmed yet to use those two pins over here as a serial port, I'm going to have to at, at least one time switch the cable over to this guy to program it one more time. But um, actually, you know what I'm going to do first? I'll have, we'll work with this one and have it send a signal to itself. And make sure that it can both send and receive. And then we'll program the other guy and then connect the two back and forth. If you guys hear yelling in the background, it's because my family is debating the pros and cons of the Book of Boba Fett right now for some reason. Okay, so first thing, always hook up the ground first. I have three ground pins I can choose between. I'm going to choose this pin three on the top here. So there's on that side, and then pin three. All right, grounds are connected. Now I'm going to connect 3.3 .3 volts, and if I hook this up successfully, the LED on the bottom, which will start blinking. If I do it wrong, it'll burn something out. <gasps> there we go. Blinking somewhat in sync, because I was just lucky there. I guess I could, like, pull it out and then plug it in. There we go. Now we got an alternating blink. <laughs> okay. So... We have the power coming from the USB, and now I've um, extended the power over to the other board. So I think, like I said before, the first thing I'm going to do is tie the D0 and D1 pins together on the primary board that we're able to program right now, and set them up as UART so that it should be able to send a signal out the TX pin and receive it back on the RX pin. We'll just have it like print something to the, that port, and then we'll just have it um, log anything it receives back. So that's pin one and two. No, pin two and three on this side. Like that. All right. 
Those two are now tied together and nothing is melting or burning up. So that's a good sign, right? So I guess the f f next thing I want to do in software is set those up as a serial port and have it send and receive. Both the discussion is pretty heated. Yeah, you guys hear it in the background? <laughs> Yeah, we watched those series as a family, and, um, yeah, it gets quite opinionated. All right. Okay. How are you doing, RoboThick? Hope you're having a good day, a good evening. So in our main... All oh, right, I moved it all into keyboard. In keyboard, there's going to be a new function where we're going to be setting up the things that have to do with the hardware. So here's a perfect place to configure the serial port. So um, I'm going to start looking stuff up because I'm pretty sure I don't need to program this from scratch. There's probably something built into, I'm guessing the RP2040 HAL to control the serial port. So I'm going to look it up. You art. There we go. Okay, there's even an example we can look at. So we have the crystal oscillator frequency, which is in our BSP crate. Configure the two pins for UART function. You need to perform clock in it before using the UART, it will freeze. Okay, so we need to make sure our clocks are initialized. So it's a UART zero peripheral, um, the two pins in a tuple or tuple, and the resets it needs to borrow. We do a new on that and then enable with a certain configure. Oh, right, the baud rate bits per byte and that kind of stuff. And I guess it needs the peripheral clock. I'm curious if it's going to own that or if it's just borrowing it or something. Okay. Let me grab these two. Because what better way to try out something than to copy paste it? That's exactly the pins that I was using, right? GPU 0 and 1? Haha, <laughs> it's almost like I planned this. Interesting. So there is no GPIO zero, but there are TX and RX. I wonder if that's what they are. Let's guess that it's TX. And let me go over there. Yep. GPIO one a zero is TX and one is RX, right? Yep. Okay. So we want TX and RX. Import function UART. I should say that if you've missed the last seven streams, I'll be uploading them to YouTube. You can also look back in the VODs. But I have gotten quite far in the software. And so we have like key sensing. We have reprogramming into the flash. And we have logging. And we have dynamic memory allocation. And all of the software is in Rust since I'm having so much fun doing programs in Rust with my hobbies. So... If you're looking at this code thinking that looks kind of like C or maybe kind of like JavaScript, but not exactly, well, it's because it's Rust. All right, you are, you are art peripheral. I'm going to import that. Okay, we don't have peripherals per se, right? Maybe it's pack. I bet it's pack. Yep, it's pack. Peripheral access crate. Let's run it at a much higher baud rate. I like running things at, was it 112800? I can't remember exactly. Let's look at the common configs. 115200. There we go. A much more respectable baud rate. Well, that's weird. How come I'm getting an error there? Is pin... What did I change here? Why is that now not importing? Well, that's weird. 
Oh, because pins is being redefined. Let's call that UART pins. Yeah, we we're shadowing the, the, the name pin, pins there by accident. Okay, so now we have a UART. And that's not a really great comment. We're going to say configure a UART universal asynchronous relay transfer. I forget what it stands for. Shouldn't I look? I should know what things stand for, right? You like my 2% keyboard? Isn't it awesome? Look, it actually works. I can press this button and I get a Q. And I can press this key and I get a W. Now all I need to do is map it to copy and paste. And that's all we need, right? Well, maybe a third button for Stack Overflow. And then copy and then paste. Three by one keyboard. Let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting carried away there. I want to look up what UART stands for again. Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Yeah. And I'm only doing UART because it's like really basic and simple. There are a couple other protocols we could use between these two. We could use I squared C, or we could use, what is it? The ser a serial SDI, serial data interface. I think UART's probably gonna be fine though. All right, um, so I need to learn how to use that UART. Two more keys and you can play Quop all day. That's right. Or maybe double tap on each one are the third and fourth functions. Sounds like hard mode Quop. Okay, we didn't have to call enable. Oh, we did have to call enable. My bad. Hey there, Adam. How are you doing? The keyboard can play Quop? Maybe. But that would be a much more sophisticated interface, don't you think? Right now it's a pretty simple serial port and keyboard interface. So you look at this, Adam. I have the... Uh, basically the ground and the 3.3 connected. And so this one's sharing the power of the primary. And right now I'm going to run the UART in loopback mode just to test it out because it's a pain to have to swap this USB between these two. I want to get sort of everything proven out in here. First, make sure the UART works. And then what I'll do is have when we program the primary, it'll first program its secondary and then program itself. And um, that's another thing I need to, I, I need to at some point have some detection ability so that the board knows that it's the primary or the secondary. Watching the nine whole minutes there. You know exactly what's going on here? You know which baud rate I prefer? <laughs> we want to go fast. What can I say? That's the fastest common configuration, at least. I don't know. I've seen this as sort of like a default. This is twice as fast. No, this is four times faster than my first modem when I was in high school. So there you go. You know which bobas you fat? Yeah. I think they're in the other room now watching Attack of the Clones. So my kids are in a let's binge watch Star Wars movies, but in chronological order. So they, they watch Phantom Menace. Now they got to watch Attack of the Clones. You got to get through the bad ones to get to the good ones. You know how it goes. Anyway, um, if I sound a little too happy, it's because I have this uh, pina colada with strawberries instead of uh, what it's normally made with, and I'm enjoying that tonight. All right, so anyway. We enabled it. We c Okay, good to know we can disable it if we want. We can have it fire on interrupts if we want. Although I don't think we need to. Disable them. Write raw. This function writes as long as it can, as soon as it's full. If zero bytes are written, a wood block is returned. Some bytes are written, it is deemed to be a success on... Upon success, the remaining slices return. I see. So you get an error if you write zero, and it would be a woodblock error. If you write more than zero, it's a success, but you get back what you couldn't write. Okay, that makes sense. So then we could just have a ring buffer, and we just try to constantly write raw to it, and whatever is returned, we would count the number of bytes, and... 
the try, number that we try to minus that would be how many we wrote, and that's how much we would advance the ring buffer, I think. Read raw. Zero. If we try to read... Why would you try to read? I guess that's if we're polling it. A wood block is returned. Okay, so read raw and write raw are pretty basic in what we want, right? I don't think I need to do the blocking ones at all. Join the reader writer halves back to the original UART. Okay, so that means we can split it if we want. Oh, there's a split. There we go. I like these APIs in Rust because sometimes you just want to have different parts of your program own the halves, and we can split it and send them off if we want to. Assuming that they're, they implement send. They do implement send. <laughs> Yeah, right there. Implement send. That's if it didn't implement send, then there'd be little point to split. Okay, and even it even implements the read trait if we wanted it to. And the write trait. I wonder how this works if it fills up though. Oh, it succeeds only if the entire slice is written, okay. And it will not return until data's been written or an error occurs. Okay. Yeah, those aren't those aren't for us, I think. Okay, I think I know what I want then. I want to have two more ring buffers. Where to put them though? I guess if we put them in here. We have these this poorly named serial. I need to rename that uh host serial. Why don't I just do that now? So refactor to host what happened? Must have hit a key by accident. Host serial. And then this one, let's rename it to host serial reader. Okay, and then I think I'll have each board call the other one its peer, because that's a pretty standard term, right? So we'll call it peer serial. And that is a UART. I was just looking at it and I already forgot what it is. UART peripheral. Ooh, it's generic on a state, a device, and a valid UART pin. Okay, I don't know what to put there yet. Right, it's whatever type this is. Ooh. Wow. That's pretty exotic. I can I can deal with that though. No big deal. That that type is perfectly normal, nothing to see here. What's a wood block? That is a special error in non blocking programming where you never want to block, but if you try to push something to the to an output or you try to pull some input and nothing moves then woodblock says well if you weren't using the non-blocking apis if you're using the blocking apis it would have blocked right there so it's 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 a just a different way of saying that data couldn't be moved or you moved data up to a point and then it couldn't move anymore that's all that it really means It's similar to shall script. I think I get it. <laughs> enabled. Oh, which which one is it from? Probably UART enabled. Then I would prefer just to say UART. Because I don't like having the name be so ambiguous. Okay, this one's easy. So is GPIO zero. Function. UART. GPIO one. Okay, now we got the full concrete type of our peer serial. And I want a peer RX. Yeah, Rx um, buffer. 
my ring buffer type. We got lots of RAM, right? We can allocate 1,024 bytes to the ring buffer and then a TX ring buffer. Okay. Just to fill these things in now. Actually, if I hit control dot struct, fill struct fields, okay, it puts them at the end, but so I can easily move them up here. Peer serial. Okay, this one I can just call ring buffer default, right? I think I'm, did I have a default? No, I guess it's, I called it new. Why did I call it new and not default? I should have called this default, right? That's, that, I'll have to look, I need to look up stuff like what is the community accepted standard there. Okay, we need a pair serial. Well, that's what I called UART, so let's just rename it. Oh, I hear Jar Jar Binks in the background, so they must be watching one of the first two movies. Okay. Uh-oh. Borrow a moved value. The peripheral clock can't be copied, and it was moved on line 278. Did I read that wrong? This function takes ownership of the receiver self, which moves clocks. Oh, it's clocks peripheral clock got moved. Okay, it's on 291. Yeah, okay, that's a problem, right? Device pins resets. Oh, it's enable. Never mind. So enable needs a conf a frequent a config and a frequency. So it's just a frequency. Then I don't need a into here, right? Don't I need like just to get its frequency? I like that. Yeah. I wonder why they used into instead of frequency. Cool, so now we, it's going to warn me that I'm not using them, which is correct. So let's just implement a simple work, uh, a simple loopback in our event loop um, that's in this run here. So we have this main event loop. Uh, here, when we are idle, do the polling we need. So we have polling the USB, scanning the keys. Let's poll the uh, peer serial. So it's going to need nothing, right? Because it's going to borrow self mutably anyway. All right. So let's put it here. So you guys have to pardon my numerous typing mistakes. I'm using my corn keyboard, but I've only been practicing and using this for about six months now and I don't know about you guys but for me it takes a long time to get used to a keyboard to the point where you're not making mistakes not only the keyboard but the layout is different I'm using Colmac mod DH so I think it was a much bigger jump from QWERTY to Colmac than I thought it would be but it's been a fun challenge Okay, so self dot peer serial dot uh, read right raw. So let's just like define a scratch buffer. What does the type? The type is mutable slice. I think we can just do it this way. This has to be mutable, right? I 
Actually, this is if I do it with a zero here, it's going to um, zero initialize the thing. For a small number like 64, it's probably not a big deal, but I should really get used to the Rust way of declaring an uninitialized array. Use Vim so changing layout doesn't really work out for you, but changing keyboard is a good idea. Use a Moonlander. Nice. Yeah, so Adam, who's also in chat, also had a Moonlander. I might still have a Moonlander. I know a few other people that have Moonlanders. I uh, made the jump straight to a 36 key corn. Uh, because I was really attracted by the thought that I could have a keyboard where I don't need to move my wrists at all. Just more ergonomical. It's also very compact. But I've heard some people really like their Moonlanders, so that's nice. Still have it, but you're very happy with the corn. Yeah, and you have the low profile keys, which are... I'm thinking more and more that that's what I'm going to do. Um... I thought about this, and I think I'm going to look at the PCBs that are there for corn, especially the low-profile ones, and I think the first one I prototype might use those low-profile switches so that I can compare with the corn that I have and these uh, prototype keys, and if I like it, maybe I'll make the real board with that. You want to try to find the, try the regular profile ones? Well, I would say that the regular profile corn keys are kind of like any other any other like keyboard of of a more traditional type that you might be able to find. You probably have already used. So, I mean, to me, they've always felt like the same as a traditional, like a more traditional, larger number of keys, traditional layout, right? Um, I don't know. Maybe you would. Uh, one thing to to try it would be the fact that they're um what is that ortholinear might make a difference but i would think that they would feel much the same as a uh, the more traditional keyboard but um from what i've heard the low pro low profile keys feel more like a laptop keyboard but i don't know i kind of want to have a side by side comparison to figure out what i what i like better all right, so that does work. We get a result back. According to what I was reading just now, it won't truly give me an error if I pass a non-empty slice. So I think I can just unwrap it uh, here, right? Read raw only returns an error of wood block if I pass zero bytes. Oh wait, no, this is slightly different. Okay, so uh, we need to anticipate a wood block error. So I misread this. Um, I'm going to blame the rum. Um, we do get an error even if we do try to write something, if none could be written. You tried to low profile, it felt like a laptop keyboard, you prefer normal keys. It's Everyone has different preferences. I've been playing around with these white switches. They make a clicky sound. And I still haven't decided if I like the clicky sound of the whites or greens or blues versus the tactile feel of the browns that I have. So my corn is using the browns cherry MX switches and they feel fine, but I've always thought that the clicky keyboards are just cool. And Mrs. Rymu doesn't like them because she thinks it's too loud. <laughs> the red keys on the Moonlander to be easy to hit. So red, I don't, you don't, you don't mean the red switches. They're, they're actually red keys on the keyboard, right? That's another thing, though. You're making me think um, Cherry MX reds are completely linear, right? They're not tactile or clicky. They're actually red keys, yeah. Oh, another thing I should say is I'm really into these key caps that have no adornment at all, no markings, because... Uh, I frequently played around with changing the layouts of the keys, and if they had some kind of letter printed on them, it would be kind of silly. That would be like pressing, um, let's say, A, and it's, and it's really um, J or something. Yeah, see, I wouldn't like it if I couldn't reach the keys either. It was worse with the Ergodex since there are so many thumb keys. Everyone's got different size hands. 
do they make like the layout of Moonlander available as an open source layout? Like um, the um, what am I thinking? Like the physical, like the PCB or the physical layout of it? Because then you could just play around with moving them and printing custom boards for it. What am I saying? I don't know anything about the Moonlander other than that it's kind of shaped weird. So we're going to match this, right? And we're going to fill the match arms. There's going to be two kinds of errors, right? The first one we're prepared to deal with. That's NB woodblock, right? I'm using this elsewhere, so... Sometimes when you see me, you see you do ES, that's because I'm not holding on the control key long enough to hit S for save. Yeah, so it's the same thing I was doing before, right? Oh, and let's grab this. Why am I getting an error there? Not found in NB? Wait, wait. Oh, did I import it directly? Oh, that's interesting. I have it in multiple places. Oh, okay. I don't like that. That's too ambiguous. Let's fix this. Um, wood block. I can see how you was... Actually, let's see. Does it re... Is it just re-importing NB? No, it's... It's actually a specific USB error. Yeah, let's be unambiguous here. Let's do that. And then we don't need to import this, right? And then we can just do that. Okay. As far as that one is concerned, it is UNB error would block. There we go. Wait, what is this saying? Oh, that kind of error, no debug trait is implemented for it? Really? That's interesting. Look at that, there's no debug trait implementation for it. Okay, but maybe we just do other and then we th we print the E. Yeah, let's do that. And I'll have to qualify that other, right? Let's see what crate it's in. Oh, it is an NB. Okay. Yeah, what am I thinking? Just like the one above it. <laughs> Okay, what's the type of that? Read error? Ooh. Okay, it does... Okay, read error type derives debug, but only with this feature. Why? Why'd they do that? I don't get it. Okay, maybe we don't even bother. Maybe we just panic and say unable to read serial port. Probably will never, will never happen. Hey there, Programmer D. How are you today? Is corn available to buy or should you make it yourself? Yeah, Adam answered that. I had this one made to order. So Adam actually in chat is the one who helped me with that. I had to pay a premium for that, though. Like Adam said, it is much cheaper to... Um... Oh, no, Adam didn't say that. I th um, from, what, from what I've seen, it's cheaper to make it yourself if you're willing to invest the time. It's more expensive to have it built for you because you're paying a premium for someone to um, make a profit off of building it for you. How am I doing tonight? Doing pretty well. It is a neat project. Look, I even have 
two boards, one being powered from the other. The, the goal today is to have the primary controller program, or at least talk to, if not program, the second controller. Because um, one thing about my corn keyboard that I don't like, see it's got two controllers connected with the TRS cable. If I like program this left hand side, this left right hand side still has the old program in it. So I have to like disconnect the USB and connect it to the right hand side and program the right hand side and then reconnect it to the left hand side. Wouldn't it be cool to just program one and have it auto program the other? I think so. So that's my goal. Um, two days ago, I worked on having the this this first controller reprogram itself when a program is sent to it over the serial port here. So all I really need to do once I get the UART connection is like before it programs itself, it can just tell the secondary one, hey, you go program yourself. And when he's done telling him to reprogram himself, then he can complete his reprogramming and then it'll be left and right staying in sync. By the way, if you want to see my notes, I have it in OneNote, kind of like Adam, but not nearly as good. But it gives a little brief intro about what I'm doing. If you're interested in what microprocessor I'm using, it's the Raspberry Pi one. And this particular board is the um, KB2040, which is a nice little board because it's pin compatible with ProMicro and Elite C. So you can drop and replace those two controller boards. Of course, you have to have different software, but it means that an existing design that uses ProMicro or Elite C could accommodate this board which is pretty dang cool. Similar to how you flash hardware at your drive, we send the images over UART and we flash to... Yeah, so it's not a new thing, right? Um, one thing that makes it kind of challenging is my memory. I have um, two megabytes of flash, but only 256K. So I envision like, well, what if my program gets to like 300K in size? We can't hold all of the program in RAM so what I'm doing is doing 4K sectors at a time. So as it receives the program, every 4K, it will write it into the top half of Flash. Um, so I'm limited to one megabyte, but that's okay. So I, I fill the top megabyte with the new program, and then when it's done, um, we don't need to talk to the USB anymore, so we go completely into RAM-only mode, and then we just copy from the high megabyte of flash to the low megabyte of flash and just put basically put the override our current program with the new program and then force a reboot this chip has got a, a unique i think way of doing a reboot most chips have like a register or uh, maybe there's a processor instruction or just something some address you jump to to reset so according to the data sheet for rp2040 the correct way of resetting is to set up the watchdog and let it kick you <laughs> you don't feed the watchdog at all you just wait until it counts down to zero and it reboots you so that's what i decided to do with um this final stage of programming is set up the watchdog to a conservative estimate of how long we'll need to actually program and do we do the programming and then we go into an infinite loop on purpose in order to let the watchdog reboot us and you might ask me hey Raimu. Why are you setting the watchdog here with the large value instead of setting it here with a very small value? The answer is that we uh, have most of our program is in Flash, including the watchdog functions. So once we start programming, and we're, we're destroying our original program, so any function calls the old program would have made goes who knows where. So we... Um, I'm very careful here to only call functions that I know are in RAM. So like program sector is in RAM because I put it in the, a data link section, right? Um, I'm still worried about things like this copy loop being replaced by memcopy by the compiler optimizing it because memcopy is in flash. That would be bad because it might cease to exist once we program over it, right? But um, yeah, I thought the most fascinating thing about this chip's flash programming is that once you're done and you want to reboot that you actually intentionally set up the watchdog to time out. <laughs> Definitely thought this out. It wasn't just me, Adam. I read the data sheet, and there have been a lot of people before me that use this for keyboards. Um, one notable one is the Pinchy. The Pinchy keyboard. 
I think I have to be very specific there. Pinchy the keyboard. So it's using the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is Raspberry Pi's board for their microcontroller. It's got a lot more pins. What's kind of cool about that is they have so many GPIOs, they don't need diodes for their keys. Each key gets its discrete GPIO back to the board, which is pretty insane. Um, but I picked, I read through, or I've glanced through or skimmed through their firmware and got some ideas from that. And we might even peek at their PCB to get some ideas, right? So looks like a Ferris. Yeah, diodeless. I was thinking another uh, a compromise Adam would be I might design my PCB through hole diodes because you can't really go wrong with that. You stick the leads through the holes and then you then you and then you um, bend them on the other side and then you put solder through the the uh, what do you call them? the through holes right just solder through the, the through holes easy peasy <laughs> i might do that actually because then i don't have to go through the um the pain of having to with a high magnitude magnifying glass um you know mess with tiny little diodes yeah we definitely don't have enough gpios on these um pro c uh, pro mag mac What's the, what's the these Elite C compatible Pro Micro compatible boards? There's not just not enough. But the Raspberry Pi Picos do. The the compromise is that those the boards are a lot, a lot longer. I already closed it. Um, pinchy keyboard. You can see from those screenshots that um, I think the board is at least fifty percent longer, and there's a lot of dead space. But you do get the cool Raspberry Pi logo on the silk screen, so you know there's compromises. Okay, we're polling this. We don't care about the error anymore because we can't really do anything with it. Wood block, we're just going to return. I guess. Do I even need to say return? I think we're just doing nothing here. There. Okay, if we do receive some number of bytes, we're going to want to push that into our ring buffer. So that's self can't type um peer oh i misspelled tx to tzx <laughs> um oh did i oh uh, this is bad i i forced a split okay i don't really want to force myself to split it so what i should do is just have Peak, read, and or peak and peak, pull and push just forward, right? Yeah, we'll just have peak call the read self dot. Um, wait. Oh, yeah. Um, other way around. This is where we put peak. So I copy that. I paste it there. Right, and then the buffer goes falls away, right? So once we get the buffer, it's just buffer dot peak. This goes away. And this is just self. Easy. Can I return local variable buffer? Oh, um, oh, because it returns, it returns a reference. Well, shoot, that is a problem, isn't it? Okay, then I'm going to back out that and figure that out later. I got to redesign that at some point, but right now I'm not going to worry about it. So I will have to split that guy. No big deal. So we'll have peer arcs buffer um, reader. And writer. 
No big deal. Suspect the software. So far, it has been about 85% of it. Although, I might spend a quite a bit of time doing the PCB work. We'll see. I don't have quite the confidence in it. I think I will be doing it in a, a couple step process, like designing a, the some kind of smaller scale PCB prototype, testing that out, and then going to the real thing. And I'm going to be doing all that PCB work on stream, and that might take me quite a while. <coughs> Probably will spend 20 to 40 hours. So yeah, that's going to be uh, quite a number of streams, right? But the software, I feel like I've gotten a lot of it done. So this is a, I mean, even though it's one row, it's the minimal key matrix, and that's working. Um, got programming working. Maybe when we get to the sophisticated things like tap versus hold. Yeah, I'm going to use KiCad. Or is it KeyCad? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It looks so good compared to the tools my friends would use years ago when they were doing PCBs. It's come a long way. It does depend on the strawberry to pina ratio. Um, I, did, I did, I think, two to one tonight. So there's quite a lot of rum in here. And now I'm out. All right, anyway, let's not get carried away. I'm going to just copy those and paste there. Okay, when I set this up, I need to split it. Um, it's probably easier to just copy those lines, actually. Import the writer. There we go. Select and go to the end of line. Put a comma there. Okay. We'll just split them out here. Where I made them. Oh, I didn't make them. Ah, uh, shoot. And I didn't finish writing that line. Configure UART zero on GPIO zero and one to communicate with the other half of the keyboard. Control or Alt Q. Okay. Set up a ring buffers to hold data uh, being sent to and received from the other half of the keyboard. I think I ordered them reader writer. So make that equal to ring buffer 1020. I shouldn't have magic numbers, but I'm going to do it. Because what else am I going to refactor later? A new split. Wait, what? Oh. Okay. I've shamed, I've already shamed myself into it. I already have a constant for the serial port, and this needs to be disambiguated. If I can hit the right keys here. I'm not hitting the right keys. F2. There we go. <laughs> this is host. This is going to be peer. Should I use tent in 2048? Sure, why not? I need two colons there. There. How come this... Okay, that's not indenting because I have errors elsewhere. I got a, got a dash. See ya, Adam. Hopefully I was able to say goodbye before you had to leave. 
kind of get wrapped up in what I'm doing and I'm not able to follow chat. What's my error here? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I have hard-coded 1024s up here, right? They need to be this. The magic of type stuff in Rust is that it, like, automatically makes sure everything matches. Okay. Now I just need the TX end. Okay. Control D. T. Still errors. Oh, right. Um, this is writer. Push. Slice of buffer up to bytes. There we go. Now it indents. Cool. Okay. That's servicing the reader. Now we need to service the writer. So let's come at these sections. Read any data. Re well, reads should be receive. Any data. I'm changing my words. It's read any data received from the peer. The other direction will be write any uh, data to be sent to the peer. And we don't need that buffer. It's more like if self.peer TX reader peak. So this should say if let sum slice, I guess. Then we do write raw. And it's just slice. And if it's okay, then we can uh, advance by that many. So now I'm happy that I made this circular buffer type. I can reuse it here. So this will be unable to write to read from. Uh, what's wrong with my bytes? Oh, um, yeah, what is wrong with it? What's bytes here? Write raw returns what? Wait, why does write raw returning a slice? Oh, it's different. Some bytes are written. It's deemed to be a success. Upon success, the remaining slice is returned. So this is going to be like remainder. So we're going to want to pull the difference between bytes length and remainder length. Right? Uh, remainder length. Uh, no, not bytes, uh, slice. Slice length and remainder length. Cool, okay, so we got the polling part. Now to actually do the loop back part, what it'll be is when we get anything from the, the Rx reader, we're gonna write it to the TX writer. I can do that anywhere. Um, let's do it. Wherever this is called. Here. Loop back peer data. So that'll be um, if let sum bytes equal self dot peer rx reader, right? Peak. What do we do if we have read something, but we can't write it? 
Yeah, then we'll, we're just going to try to write as much as we can. Um, let written equals self dot peer tx writer push. Oh, I um, don't have overflow protection on this, so there is no written. I think that's fine for now. We're, so we're just going to write the bytes. And then we'll immediately just pull them out of the reader. Pull. Bytes length. All right, let's see if that works. Actually, to make it work, I have to kind of send a test message to the peer somewhere. So can we do that? Wait a minute. Two more things, actually. We should do something with what we receive back, and then we should send something to begin with. OK, so log whatever we receive from the peer. If let okay, it sucks actually. Some I don't know why I'm doing it here. I should do it with the other stuff right here. This isn't even the right place. Um, here's the right place. Log whatever is to be received from the peer. If some bytes equals self dot. Oh, wait a minute. I can do it here, right? Okay. This is what I want. This is, I don't need this right now, but that's eventually what I want the secondary guy to do. The primary is going to just log what he receives and um, send something. So, okay. I want some of this stuff. I don't want to push it into the writer, though. I want to just log it. So, info received from peer. Colon, question mark, right? Bytes. And then we need to send something. So, um, send a test message to the peer periodically so by periodically i think we can use one of these timers right so let's do that set up a timer to regulate how fast we send a test signal or te test message to the peer so this will be the Peer test timer. Peer test timer start. I, I think I just hard code this right. Let's say every second, every hundred mil, every thousand milliseconds. And actually, I can use this scheme right. Where I have the same kind of a match, and I can just actually I can do it outside of this match right. Yeah, let's do it here. Uh, I hit the wrong keys and the undo. Okay, there we go. Let's put it right here. Okay, this would be peer test, right? Hey there, Metro. How are you doing? I have two controllers today. I'm wiring. I have them wired up, and I'm going to. I'm working on have them talk to each other. Ultimate goal today is to have one program the other. Yeah. It's not that hard once you know the pinout of the board. You just connect the grounds together and 3.3 volts together, and now they're both powered. <laughs> and what I'm doing to talk to them is I'm hooking up D0 and D1, which are TX0, TX, and R TX and RX0, which is the UART function, um, just because it's simple. 
And what we're going to do is every time um, this test timer fires, we're going to send the message to the over that serial port. So I have these um, ring buffers set up with in the polling loop to like pull data th from the UART and push data out to the UART. So with the writer, we're just going to push in a message. Um, in binary, let's just say, hello, friend. Now that I think about that, I should probably keep it simple, right? Let's just make it the five character sequence, hello. Wood block, we don't need to do anything, right? Error will panic. So this will be, this is where I need this send a message periodically. Okay, let's fix the warnings. I have a warning on this guy. What is it? Too complicated? I thought so. So, hey, let's make a type. Type. Peer serial port. Equals that. Now I replace the complicated type. There. Easy. All right, no warnings. Build it. And because of the work I did on Wednesday, I don't even need to touch the board. I'm just going to run my programmer. Uh, why is the window not open? I don't have the window open. New window. I don't know how, what happened, but I must have closed it. So yeah, cargo... Oh, wait. I never did make a script for this. I really should because it's a pain to have to type this a lot. So let's make a new one called um, program. I'm in Windows. Don't don't beep, hate beep. me. Don't hate me that I'm in Windows. It's gonna be cargo run and then dash dash program dot dot backslash rusty dash keyboard backslash target backslash thumb v six m dash none dash e a b i i think we'll have to double check that Re release backslash rusty keyboard dot bin okay let's try it Okay, so reprogrammed it. Oh, check it out. It's working. It's looping back to itself. So if I unhook one end of it, then it stops. See that? Hook that back up. And it's dead. <laughs> I killed it. Uh, let me reset it. Did it die when I unplugged it? It did. That's weird. So let me reset it. Oh wow, interesting. So when the UART is not connected, it crashes somewhere. But uh let's unhook the other end. Well that's really weird. So what would cause it to float? Or what would cause it to crash if it's floating like that. But, uh... well, I mean, obviously the whole thing is working, right? Because it's it's receiving what I'm sending, which is H-E-L-L-O, over and over again, right? It's receiving H and then receiving back the E-L and then the L-O. That's Those are the ASCII uh, codes for the number, the, the H-E-L-L-O I'm sending. But why would it be so sensitive to being unconnected like that? But, uh... Huh. Oh, I know what it is. 
It's probably returning an error if the port is floating. But, uh, I bet that's what it is. So let me go f put something other than panic in there. Uh, that would be down here where we pull the pure cereal. I bet you we're getting into these two. That would be, it should be an E. Um, you know what, I guess for now we could just ignore it. Yeah, why don't we just ignore all errors? In both directions, because there's not really anything that I can do if an error happens on this. So... Let me just verify this. Actually then, like it's trying to warn me, I can reduce this to be an if okay. In fact, it can do it for me, look at that. Such a cool function this Rust Analyzer is. Good night! I got one kid going to bed. Okay, and then we'll do the reprogramming here. Yes? But, uh... Okay, now let's, it should not be sensitive to me unplugging it. Cool. So it didn't crash, and it breaks the connection, and when I plug it in, it starts receiving it again. Okay, so then let's program it so that... Um... Oh, no. First, let's see if we can figure out how... Well, let's see if we can figure out how to get the board to know if it's the primary board, like it's plugged into the USB or not. I'm guessing there's a way through the USB device to know if we're plugged into the host. And then we can we can configure off of that, right? Hey there, Endorn. How are you doing? How are peoples in the EU? I'm having these um, two controllers almost talking to each other. Right now, through this green wire here, the primary controller is talking to itself, which you're seeing on the screen here. It's sending H-E-L-L-O over and over again. Waking up at 7 a.m. But for you, it's Saturday. Why are you awake at 7 a.m.? Don't you sleep in? That's what I do on Saturdays. <laughs> so, Endurin, I don't know if you were here at the end of last stream, but I got my keyboard firmware to be capable of programming itself. Good question. You have no idea why you're up. It's because you sensed that Raimu was streaming and you needed to watch Raimu. Right. You support your uh, your friend in the in America. And during you missed Adam. He was in chat a little bit ago. Programmer D is here though. So let me look up the USB stuff from the board support package because I bet you. There's something about, like, sensing if it's active. Like, maybe we can ask the USB bus if it's active? Doesn't seem to be a lot that we can do with it other than pass it to something else. Um, I wonder if it's in the more generic USB device crate. USB device. That's what we're using, right? USB device, there it is. All right, API, here we go. Can we ask the USB device if it's plugged in? Oh, there's state. What if we use that? Default addressed configured suspend. Okay, so when it's not plugged in at all, it's probably going to be default, right? And if it is plugged in, I expect it's going to go configured. So what if we say, if we're in the configured state, transmit our test message. Otherwise, loop back what we receive. All right, let's do that. So that was down here somewhere, right? Yeah, here we'll say 
if connected to USB, if not connected, uh, no, if connected to USB, log whatever we receive from the peer. Otherwise, loop back peer data. Either way, we're peeking into the PRX buffer, right? So here it'll be if self dot USB device dot state if let USB device state configured. equals USB device state, then do something, otherwise do something else. In fact, the something else is already here. We just need to take this and place it here and delete this. Import that. Cool, so now only if we're USB is configured will we log what we receive. I guess this pull can go outside, right? If our USB is not configured, we're going to assume we're the secondary device and we're going to loop back our data, right? Okay, so then the other place was down here, right? Um, if connected to USB, send a test message to the peer periodically, right? So again, I got to copy this. If that is true, do that. Okay, so now I gotta build this and program it on both boards. Um, let's do the primary one first, I guess. But, uh... It is sending, and it's logging when it gets back, but it's sending to itself, right? Right. Okay, cool. Now, if I disconnect... Hold on. Um, I'm going to have to use my other wire, my yellow one here, right? Because I want to wire the TX from one to the RX of the other, right? Yeah, so this green one will be... Rx, so we lo so green is from secondary back to primary. So the transmit, that's this pin, and then the third one, so the receive on the on the secondary goes to the transmit on the primary. See, uh, just a little bit of hardware. Otherwise, as a software guy, I'll get too freaked out. Okay, so now I would need to flip these around. Uh, right? So now this guy is the primary. But he doesn't have the program loaded in yet, so I gotta do the programming. Uh, oh, there we go. It's working. We got full ping back and forth. Right? And it shouldn't matter which end I plug in. Whichever I plug in, whichever uh, end I plug in is going to be the primary. But, uh, Yep, it's working. It's working. That's so cool. So this is gonna this is simulating the TRS link, and um, we got full loop. Like it's sending a message and then bouncing it back and then logging it. Okay, so then the the last step is to have pro programming forwarding, right? That's the ultimate thing to do here. Let's uh, let's work on that. So, Control C that guy. Uh, what am I doing? This we can just go full screen with this other side. There we go. Um, let let me check in what I have here.
You're right, so I know what I did here. Configure you art bus between keyboard halves. So right now send I uh, have the primary board or primary side uh send test message every minute every, every second and uh, um and log anything it receives back Right, actually we can do this with bullets right now, right? And then have the secondary loop back everything it receives. Loop back to the peer everything it receives. get push that what's the goal we're trying to achieve i'm trying to make a keyboard so uh, for example i have this corn keyboard right it's a split keyboard and on each end there's a there's a microcontroller board it's the elite c that's what that c is that you see so i had this built for me and i like it so what i'm doing is now the next step of um, my keyboard journey which is to try to make my own keyboard since i'm a software guy i'm mostly focusing on the software but these are the microcontrollers that i picked they're raspberry pi picos so you want to learn more about that here's a link to that but essentially i am doing the software for these microcontrollers so in the last seven streams i handle like booting it up allocating memory um, the making uh, the key scanning work. So right now I have these two test keys. So I've hit the one on the left, I get a Q. I hit the one on the right, I get a W. Right. I have serial ports on them. So if I um, just run this without programming, it's just going to dump out what's seen on the key. So now um, uh, I had logging working. So um, if it has something to say, it says it on the serial port. See, if I start pressing keys, you see the keyboard reports. If on my other keyboard, I turn the caps lock on and off, you see those reports. Those are um, whether or not the caps lock is on or off as part of the host report. So I'm proving out a lot of the software first. Um, eventually, I'm going to have to move on to the hardware stuff. So the, um, the CAD tool I'm going to use is KiCad, K-I-C-A-D. I'm going to be designing the circuit board to have all the keys I want in the right arrangement and add some LEDs and diodes and sockets for these microcontrollers. And then I'll have a board house build them for me and then I'll solder everything on and then pretty much have one of these, only one that I made myself. So that's the ultimate project. I expect it's going to take probably another 20 streams. So we're eight streams into it. I have a lot of the hard software concepts proven out, right? Soon I'm going to have to move on to the real thing, which is designing circuit boards. I'm not doing the controllers hardware from scratch, but I'm doing the software from mostly, well, I, can't, I shouldn't say scratch, because scratch would imply that it's bare metal, but we're not doing this in bare metal rust. I am using some uh, foundational libraries that some really nice people made. They, they're called the RPRS group or team. And this is all in rust, right? So they've made rust crates for the microprocessor itself, which is the ARM Cortex M. And they've also made board support packages and hardware abstraction layers. So this board is from Adafruit. It's pin compatible with the Pro Micro or an Elite C. It's called the KB2040 or KEEB2040. And there is a um, board support package, very light. On top of the microcontroller's own hardware abstraction layer, RP2040 HAL, and we're using that heavily in my code. So I'm not, I'm not doing everything from scratch. I'm using things that are in those libraries. So like when I set up the USB... I can show that in like the new. 
down here somewhere. Yeah, so I make this USB bus object is actually in the 2040 how crate. I didn't have to make this. I just construct one. I give it the right inputs, and then I, it's taken care of for me. And then I make the serial, um, the uh, the HID and serial port classes on top of that USB bus. And then I use a USB device driver, right? All of this stuff I didn't write. So I would say that I'm writing embedded software somewhere between bare metal and having an OS. I had to set up my own heap, but rather than writing it from scratch, I did choose this linked list allocator. Um, but I did, ha I did have to reserve RAM for it. So if you look at my heap.rs, I picked some memory addresses in RAM and I said, allocator, have fun. You have this uh, 64 kilobytes of RAM to play with, right? Um, there's not much uh, other than those, li those libraries, those crates that I have. So there's no OS, there's no file system. Um, there's very little observable effects to start with. That's one of the reasons why I went and added a serial port driver to this thing. Um, I'm in the wrong file. Ah, sorry, I'm trying to jump to where I'm describing things. This thing, um, no, not that thing. Sorry. <laughs> I'll get to it eventually, I swear. This serial port to the host is so that I can um, get more than just an LED to blink. So I can um, print things from my program and see them appear on this console. It's a lot better than blink than just blinking an LED. Just got yourself an Arduino Nano with RB2040? Tried but failed to figure out how to use Rust on it. Well... If you can access the RP2040 and program it, you should be able to do with that what I did and use these same Rust crates. Um, there, it's not shown here because we don't directly depend on it, but the look of the twenty the RP2040 HAL crate that's that's a that that's been a big help. Um, this guy, uh, home page, right? Okay, well this is the group that makes it. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, if you don't, if you haven't seen this, definitely check it out if you're using an RP2040 and you want to use Rust on it, because there, there's getting started programming guides and all the stuff gathered around just this microcontroller. Making your own ASIC is a challenge, because unless you're fabricating something with a very small process like that, you're probably going to do it in an FPGA, and that's a whole other set of skills. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't have that capability. The farthest I'm going to go is I'm going to make a custom circuit board and mount these controllers on them, solder them to it. Oh, you're you're new to Rust. You might have missed some config part of that. Maybe it's a different kind of Rust, right? The moment you do something like this at the top of my main, this no standard you're basically taking the training wheels off, and you have no standard library, no operating system interface. You're you kind of on your own unless you have one of these, you know, foundational crates made by someone else to depend upon. You wrote a processor on FPGA. The FPGA is ridiculous for a keyboard. I mean, sure, we don't really need much. An FPGA might be convenient just so you, for the USB. You wouldn't have to worry about that. You could just put in the USB some someone's USB. Um, what do they call it in FPGA? Like a module. Just plop that down somewhere in your FPGA to handle the USB, wire it up, and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, core, I think it is, right? You could just plop down the USB core in, in your FPGA. Um, but yeah, other, with, for the signaling, I mean, it's just sensing the keys, right? And some kind of serial protocol if you, if you have a split. Um, we're, we're totally... Uh, overkill with this microcontroller, right? We don't need two megabytes of flash. I don't really need 256k of RAM. It, it's, it's like I'm kind of spoiled having that much RAM. <laughs> I think it's called an IP core, like intellectual property, or does like the IP stand for something else? But yeah, I think you're right. 
Yeah, I mean, you can you can start with a small FPGA, something of that same form factor as the RP2040. Just plop down the IP cores for the peripherals that you need, which was just, for me, it's just the serial ports and USB port, right? Don't need much else. Okay, um, getting back to what I was doing, now that I have a link between these boards, I want to alter the programming. There's two things I need to do. We need to receive programs over the UART rather than the USB serial port, which shouldn't be too hard. Second thing is when we are receiving a program and we're the primary board, we need to have an extra step where we forward the program to the secondary board. So let's first do the receiving end first. Um, let me find where we're actually processing. So here it is. We have this function called process serial input. I could just call this from two places, right? If we receive data from the UART and we're the secondary board, we can just call process serial input, right? That That's easy. Let's do that. Which means I need to take out our loopback, right? Right here. Yes, 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 yes. Actually, let me change this a little bit. Wouldn't it be cool to see the log messages from the secondary board on the primary board? Yeah, let's do that first. So instead of just infoing this, what we'll do is we'll wait until we receive an entire line and then we'll log it together. Kind of similar to how I had the process serial. Um, this one. In this next, I think, I had it scan for a new line and only when we get one do we process a line so let, let's do that back in where we are um, doing this um pull pair serial no not there in the main um run here if connected to usb log whatever we log We'll collect whole lines. Received from the peer and log them. Otherwise, this is important, process the data as if we had received it from the main serial bus, the, the host serial bus, e.g. support programming. Okay. Actually, this, the, the secondary support here is easy. Instead of doing this loopback, let me put a comment here. This performs a simple loopback. And then we'll comment it out. So instead of the loopback, what we're going to do is... Um, well, we already said what we're going to do, so let's just do it. It's self.process serial input. And... Oh, it needs a state? Oh, right. Um... Yeah, it's this guy. Actually, it's kind of like this. Yes, yeah, so it's that equals, and then the input here is bytes, right? Yeah, there we go. I did it. Okay, it didn't work completely because can't borrow it from mutable because it's also borrowed immutable, which occurs on 520. Yeah, okay, so then, um, solution to that, I think, is we're going to need to make a copy of those bytes. I think. Uh. And do it without making a copy here. 
Oh, have a good day or a good evening, programmer D. Yeah, intellectual property, that's what you hear people saying who work with FPGAs. Yeah. It would cost about an armored leg over a simple microprocessor, probably, but it would be fun. V842248. Okay, let me think about this borrow checker problem. This is essentially because I made process serial and put mutable over self. Does it need to be mutable over self? Okay, it does not. So why did I make it mutable? There. Oh, because it modifies received, that's why. Almost got away with it. It modifies the received array. I might want to refactor that later. Um, this would be far easier if I could call this. Actually, I know what I should do. I should move this out of the function completely. Then, yeah, then we're going to call, when we call from two different places, the data we receive from two different places, right? So let's show the references. So here, we're pushing that in. So we're extending from this slice. And we don't need to pass that in. I need to modify this so there's no input now. We don't need to do this step anymore, right? Okay. Now when we call it from the other place here, we can extend from slice with bytes, right? With just bytes. Then I don't need to borrow that anymore, and then this should compile. Yes? No. Self is borrowed on 515. But we don't need bytes anymore. Can I just say drop bytes here? Um, no. Immutable borrow occurs on 515. Wait, but I dropped it. Oh, because of this. Right, so then um, we just need to capture bytes lane. So, uh, num bytes, I guess. So we can, so that the drop can actually happen. Yeah, and then it's going to probably tell me I don't need to do that. Yeah, it's a reference. Don't need to drop it, right? Cool. So that's good for the secondary board. For the primary board, we need to forward the program. I think I can do that in process serial in input, right? Why don't we just forward anything we get from the primary serial to the secondary serial as we get it? Right? Wouldn't that make it easiest? So that both boards are getting the same data. Yeah. Actually, even easier, if this is called from here, I can just immediately forward it, right? Why wait? If we receive anything from the host, we know we're the primary board and we can just send it. So that's, that's easy. So we'll just do here self, uh, peer TX writer push the uh, same input. I don't want to mention it twice, so I'll just say let input equal that. And then that is the input. And that goes there too. Easy. So then. I should say so in the comment. If you receive anything on the serial player, append it to our receive buffer and forward it to the to the other to the um, other half of the keyboard. Uh, 
Uh, this actually doesn't, that doesn't apply anymore. Cool. Did I just do it? I'll have to program both boards independently at least one more time, right? And I might want to disconnect the, the, the link between them when I do this. I can, let's just, let's do one board. Build. And then, as long as it builds, I'm going to go to the other one and, um, program. Okay, now it's programmed. I must have left this in by accident. Oh, I didn't complete that, did I? Okay, back. Let me. Okay, now it's going to forward things, which I don't want right now. So let me unplug. Um, really just want to unplug the transmit line. Which one was that? The yellow one. So he's not receiving anything anymore. Right. So the message is stopped because not receiving it, so he's not going to um, loop it. Okay. So then, yeah, I missed a step. Right. When um, when we receive something over from the peer, we want to actually get whole lines, and I forgot to do that part. Right. Where was that again? Oh, this I wanted to remove. Yeah, we're not doing this anymore. Well, let's comment it out. Just in case I want to bring that test back. This is It's going to say we don't use that, but that's okay. Here's where it was, right? I wanted to change this to be whole lines. Yeah, and I forgot to finish that work. Um, go back to process serial input, because I wanted... To copy this bit of code here. Actually, is that what I want? Yeah. And then we'll go back a few times here. That's what I want. If it is bytes iter. Oh wait, one problem I have here is that if it wraps around in the in the ring buffer, we might have part of the part of the line that might have the line fragmented into two pieces. So really to fix that, I should be like reassembling things into a a buffer that holds the entire message. Okay, then I know what to do. I will make in self, which is keyboard. We have this received. Can I use that? No, can't use that. I mean, I could say like peer log and make that a vector. Why don't I do that? Why don't I do that? Yeah, I like that idea. Okay, that's what we have now. Okay, so then we first need to extend it so self dot peer log dot extend um, or actually it's this thing and then we grab self peer log and iterate that and if we see a new line then we pull the line out and log it Really, I should just log the line as it is. Or let's say peer. And um, 
that's a size, right? So... It'll be a slice up to a slice of um, self peer log. Up to bytes plus one, so I need an, an, a term for that. So, like, um, length or something. I'm, I'm terrible with names. So, then this is just the log up to length. And then we're going to want to turn that into um, a string. So what's it like? Is it core? Or is it alloc? I think it's alloc. From UTF. I, I need to look this stuff up. <laughs> Only so much stuff I can cram in my head. U-T-F. Oh, it's in both core and alloc. What about, what about core here? Yeah, so this will work, right? If we get a slight, so it's just, we'll just say if okay. Uh, if okay string well message equals um, we'll take this part off and put it here from ut f8 Then log it. Trimmed, right? What did I get wrong here? Mismatch types. Expected bool found in that. Wait, what? Oh, if let, okay. So if we can convert all the bytes up to and including that new line into a UTF string, then trim it and log it. Cool. And then and only then we're going to drain it out. So self dot peer log dot drain. Um, I forget how I do this in the other place. Do this in process serial um, in the next function, right? How do I do this? Oh, no, it's not in next. It's one up, one level up. This one. Okay, drain dot dot consumed. That's an integer or u size, right? Cool. So then it's just drain dot dot bytes. Or dot dot length. Okay, so with that, we should see log messages from the secondary board. Right? So let's program this in. Yeah, I don't even need to transmit. I can just receive, right? So we have the transmit from the secondary received on the primary. So we should at least be able to see log messages. So let's reprogram. But, uh, um, let's reset this guy. Oh, he's not going to actually transmit anything. Um, okay. That he doesn't have anything to say <laughs> right now. If I had these boards swapped, it would. Okay, so let's um 
swap these two. So unplug this side. And then we'll program this guy. Ba -da. Ba -da. Ba -da. Ba -da. Um, it didn't reconnect. It didn't recognize the device. What? It reset. Ba -da. Ba -da. Oh, am I having trouble with the bus again? Um, either ba -da. that or. This one's. Ba -da. Yeah, okay. Ba -da. This USB bus that I'm using sometimes doesn't work. Now my camera's still working. Well, this is going to cause the camera to fail, but that's okay. Let's unplug it. Ba -da. Plug it back in. Ba -da. And I'm going to have to restart the camera. Camera's back. Okay. Let's plug this one in again. Ba -da. There we go. Connecting to it. Cool. So I'm going to program it. Because I don't remember if I programmed it or not. Oh, great. My main keyboard's not working. Ba -da. Ba -da. Hmm. Wait a minute, now it's working. Wait, why does control C not work? Okay, it was okay, it wasn't the keyboard, it was just stuck. Okay. Program this board, please. Ba -da. Okay, cool. Now when I hit a key here. Oh okay, I need to have them both connected, I guess. Um, it's not working. <laughs> so I should be able to see the keyboard logs from hitting a key up here, but it, it's not, I'm not seeing it. So what does that tell me? Oh, wait, wait. He, to, to send the logs in the first place, I have to send it to the correct serial port. I forgot about that. Okay. Then, um, swap boards ba -da. again. Ba -da. And, um, yeah, I forgot that part. <laughs> oh, this will be tougher though, right? In the, it's in the logger. Yeah, when we um, set up the keyboard, we give the logger access to the primary serial port, but it might need the secondary serial port, right? Where's the logger set up? Right here. I give it access to the main writer, but we actually want to give it the other writer if USB is connected. And we don't actually know at this point if it is connected or not. Yeah, okay, that's a problem. So we're not going to see log messages. But the programming should work. It, um, let me try this. So they both the boards know which one's which. The primary will forward messages to the secondary. If the secondary receives anything from the, from the UART, it's going to act as if it received it from the host. So I should be able to program these simultaneously now. We won't be able to see log messages from the secondary board yet. But I can like change, so to prove it, I'm going to change, to prove that I can program both boards simultaneously, I'm going to change the color of the LED right now. Um, let's make it green. I just need to remember where I put that. That was in run, right? Yeah, here it is. So let's make it green instead of orange. Two fifty zero two fifty five zero, right? Actually, I don't remember if I uh, built before I programmed last time. Anyway, here goes nothing. Okay, the secondary board didn't do anything. <laughs> but the primary board reprogrammed itself.
Ba-da. Disconnect both, connect this one. Ba-da. Let me make sure both keywords have the same program by um, programming this one now. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's not forwarding the program to its peer. So we'll have to review it and figure out why. Let's look and see why. So first the message comes from the main serial port, right? So it'll go into this um, next. Oh, wait. No, it won't go here first. Sorry. <laughs> it'll hit here first. If it comes out of the USB serial port, we're supposed to send it to the peer whatever we got. Uh, does it extend from slice, consume the slice? No, it doesn't. It just copies, right? Yeah. So this, it should be forwarding everything it receives to the other board. Question is with the other board, is the other board gonna do the right thing with what it receives? That's down here, right? USB is not configured. Yeah, I mean, this should do it. I wonder why it's not. Huh. Here's where I have a problem where um, I, uh, there aren't very many side effects that I can observe <laughs> to know if it's actually getting to this point in the code. I could alter the color of the LED here. Just to see if it hits this point in the code. Okay, that's worth it. Um, so we want to make it not blink on the secondary board then. Actually, that's a good thing to test anyway. Um, We'll just put a check here. If, what is it again? If this, if this line, right? If we're this, if we're the primary board, blink the LED. Let me, let me just, let me just do this one step at a time. We'll put this check in here and program both boards and make sure that that does what I expect it to do. Okay, so that's one board. Let's program the other one. And you see this one's no longer um, blinking because it knows it's a secondary board. Okay, so it's blinking because it knows it's a primary board. Switch to this end. And it blinks, but this one doesn't. Okay, so only the primary board blinks. So then that means I have the LED is available for me to use for like debugging. So what I wanted to see was um, it turn a different color if we get to this point in the code. So this is just a test here. Let's make it go red. Um, I copy from the wrong line, right? I should copy the brightness, which is eight. Uh, there. Okay. Program this in. Okay, and the other board. No breakpoints, no debugger. That's right, 10x programmer. Okay. So now when I program this one, it should be forwarding it to this, so this one should write, light up red. Okay, it lights up red. I have no idea why it doesn't actually 
detect the program, though. I, I must be scrambling the message, right? It must be. But, uh... But, uh... So I can move the code to see... It sh let's, let's have it only light up red if it actually goes into the program state. So that means I move this uh, line into here, which goes into here. Yeah, let's let's do it right here. But only if it's the secondary board. Um, I should make a helper function for this. This line here, right? Let me refactor this. Like, function is primary board. Is primary half? Or is primary controller? It's just if the USB is configured, right? No let. Oh, I know I do need an if then true else false. Okay, let's search for this. Can I just say final references? I can, okay. Oh, this is someone else's crate. You use the logic analyzer and look at the transmitted bus? Yeah, if I had a logic analyzer, I might do that. All right, so then this becomes if self dot is primary controller. And again here. Okay. Final references to that. Cool. Okay, so then we can repeat that back um, up here. We can say, if not the primary controller, make the LED red. If we would, if we get to this point, right? Can I not use self here? Oh shoot. Uh, we can't use it from next. So let's pass in another. Let's pass another argument. Is primary controller, and then just remove the. Um, oh, but it doesn't have access to the NeoPixel. Dang it. Okay, then I'll, another way to do this is to check the state from the caller of next. So let's remove that. Find who calls next here so if it's not the primary controller and well if let serial input state receiving program well let's just say if it's not um no Let's just do it this way. Serial input state. Yeah, I'm just trying to hack something together. So if we're receiving a program, actually let's do the receiving program size because that happens first. If we're receiving the program size, yeah, and we're not the primary controller, then turn the LED red. I like that better. Okay, so then, so there's a shorter way to do this. Oh, with matches, right, right. Okay, I always forget matches. Hey there, Rylex, has it been a few years? You bought this here recently, eBay, it is illegal Chinese. Why are we talking about this 10X programmer? Is it a keyboard or something? What is that? 
A lo oh, a logic analyzer. What's illegal about it, then? Huh. I've never actually used one of those logic analyzers before. Oh, oh, I see. So it's like a... I get it. It's like a... Unauthorized clone. It would be illegal here, but in China it's probably perfectly fine, right? Alright, so... Let's see. What was I doing? Build this? I forgot if I built it or no, I did build it. And then we're programming this end. Okay. Now that top uh, one is programmed to turn the LED red if it gets into the uh, second second step of programming. So we're going to program the second board. Okay, so it did get that far. But, uh, it's just not getting all the way to the end for some reason. Let me let me check to make sure it's getting to the um, third step now. So I'm just going to progress until I reach the point where it I know it's not receiving the correct information anymore. So it would be um, process serial input if it gets into the receiving program. What? Oh, I'm doing undo for some reason. Right, receiving program state. If it gets into that state, make it red. You know, it's going to turn out probably to be something silly I forgot to do. But, uh, All right. Unplug but, that. Uh, Plug this in instead. But, uh, and then program. Okay, yes, yeah, so it is. It's receiving the same uh, program uh, sectors. It's just not um, completing the cycle and rebooting. But, uh, but, uh, there is one more step we can um, have it get to before we turn the LED red, right? Which is the final programming stage. Um, that's inside of this next, though. It's going to be hard to find. It's when we get to... Um, commit reprogram <laughs> one way we could do this is have it move this out of the next function and have a special state called commit and have the caller do this right what if I do that that shouldn't be too hard to do so basically move this out to the caller of um, next here right in fact that's I, that's what I wanted to do anyway right if we get to the commit then do that uh, we need the size right And self watchdog. Well, mute self watchdog, right? Down here. Right. So if we get to the commit state, which we're about to invent, if we're not the primary controller, turn the LED red. Actually, why don't we have it just turn a different color? If we're the primary, have it turn one color. If we're the secondary, have it turn a different color. Um, actually, why don't we just always have it turn red? That'll be useful in its own. Red will tell us that it's that it's reprogramming itself for the final commit, right? Yeah, I like that. So it's always going to turn red if it gets to this spot, and then it's going to commit to reprogramming. So let me add the state. Commit um, U32.
and what happened to and the MMORPG I was working on? I had to stop working on it because I got a full-time job, so I only have time for a little bit of a of hobby work, and I have to pick something that doesn't con have a conflict of interest with my job. So doing um, what I was doing with the game was it was all like um, available online for anyone to play, and that's yeah they don't like that, so can't do that. But I can do stuff like I've been a code. I can do hobby projects like this that have nothing to do with my work. I guess I need to add a state here, right? Commit where we just do nothing. Or well, basically, we return the same state. And here, instead of doing this, we're going to go into that state directly with this value. Okay. It's actually cleaner that way because this state machine then doesn't really do the commit, the final commit, right? It, um, it just moves it to that state and then here, if we get to that state, then we do this. Hockman doesn't like this size. Oh, dereference it. I hope I didn't take your job, Rylex. So I didn't have a job and now I do. And you had a job and now you don't? <laughs> Is this some kind of karmic balance? Well, I hope that you didn't want to have a job. Because it sucks that if if you wanted to have a job and now you don't, that's that's you know that sucks. If so, I hope that you find one that you like. Let's okay. I have a warning before I build. Let me fix the warning. What is it? All oh, right, this doesn't need the watchdog anymore. Even cleaner, even better. Doesn't need the watchdog. Build that. I never saw it. Nope. So it must not be replacing your job, because I don't use PHP ever, even at my job. Okay, I have an error somewhere here. Oh, because we were passing in the watchdog, now we don't. Yeah. Oh, the other thing we should do, um, I can still reprogram the NeoPixel from different places here, right? What if I, like... Um, Let's have the LED cycle through different colors if it's the secondary board and it goes through various states. So let's do a match on this. Take that out. Just type in that out. And we're going to, um, I guess there's no case. Getting confused with C again. Fill the other match arms. Right, so let's not do anything for norm. Well, I could do something for normal. I mean, the NeoPixel doesn't mind if I keep giving it new input, right? Yeah, so we could have it, we could have it do this. Okay, let's just do this. So... This code, right, in all three of these places, sort of, actually, hold on, let me think about this. Let's, let me type it, no, I can do all three simultaneously, right, I can just do this. Ah, uh, that didn't work out quite as expected. <laughs> we need to say, um, if, whoops, if not self dot is primary controller then change the pixel color and then I want this copied here and here okay so now we have um, places where um, where every time we get some serial data and we go into one of these states um, we're always going to start we're always going to make the LED red if we're about to reprogram and reset, right? 
other states if it's the normal and we're not the primary controller let's make it the normal be just like green on so that's a zero here 255 it gets if it gets a program size um how about blue and what do we do if we're receiving a program how about white So now I just have different colors for all the different states, so we can tell what state it is in all the time, right? Build that. Program it into one board. Okay, and then the other board. Oh, it turned white. So it's receiving the program, but it didn't get the end of the program. That's what that's telling me. Okay, so this board is stuck in the program state right now. Right? It's stuck in this state. It doesn't think it has received all the program yet. I wonder if it's a case where we're um, jamming too much data in and we're losing data. That's possible, right? It's certainly possible. We could be um, just losing, we could be dropping bytes. So where would we possibly be dropping bytes? It could be that my um, ring buffers are blowing up, right? I should double check that the code is correct in this run, right? Poll, poll uh, not run, poll, peer, serial. Okay, so we can receive up to 64 bytes at once, and we end up pushing that into the, the Rx buffer. And if we have stuff to send to the T, uh, to the transmit, then we'll try to write it to the serial. And if we were able to write something, then whatever's left over right so, so the length of the leftovers subtracted from the length of what we tried to write is what we actually wrote and that's what we pull out of the reader right okay and just to refresh my memory pull adds that number and then modulos on the head okay so I mean that looks okay the only problem is if we receive data too quickly, this push can um, hit the end. Right here, if this break happens. If that break happens, then we'll, we'll lose data. So how often are we checking the circular buffer, right? That's what I should be looking at. I should be looking for peer rx buffer reader. Here. Only if what would block? Oh, only if we're waiting on the LED. Okay, so... This should happen immediately because... Um, here's where we actually write to it here we should immediately get something out when we peek right and where do I pull those bytes out I pull them down here okay it 
You know, this if should be a while, now that I think about it, because if we wrap around, we might have to call it twice. But that's okay. I, I, I mean, is that what it is? Is it just receiving it too quickly and getting overwhelmed? You guys can barely see the lights on this, right? There's the white LED. There's the blinking green one. That blinking green, the blinking ones are easy to see because you can see the activity. When it's solid white, it's hard to see it. All right, I feel like I'm almost there. I just need to find out why it's not um, receiving all the bytes. Hey there, Blazar, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm trying to have two microprocessor, two microcontrollers, one connected to my computer with this USB cable, and I want, when I program it from the computer, that it forwards the program to this other guy and have them both reprogram themselves simultaneously. I am having fun with Rust. Most of the problems I'm running into are misunderstandings of the hardware and other hardware issues. I think right now I have the hardware issue where this board is forwarding the program to this board over this wire, this serial port wire, and I think it's just not all the bytes are being received properly on the other end. So there's that pair of function calls that are crucial to that. This read raw and then this write raw. Loop is readable. Wood block. Buffer length. Oh. Bytes length red starts at zero, right? And then it tries to read that register. I mean, it's possible we're getting an overrun error, right? I wonder if that's happening and we could check for that. But even if I got that, how would I express that? Maybe turn the LED a different color? I could do that, right? We could check for these specific errors, turn the LED a special color, and maybe just... Um, just infinite loop just to see if it's happening okay so we get an other read error this is what I, this is what we're going to look for right other read error Okay, and I'm guessing the right has a similar thing, like the right raw can fail with a overrun as well. Oh, it actually doesn't. Either we can either, okay, so it's probably on the reader side, right? Because the writer side's pretty simple. We can either write to it or we can't, and then it clocks out the bits, right? Yeah, it's giving us the remainder. Okay. Let me try to catch the error here. So instead of saying if let okay, we're going to match on this. And okay bytes does what we already had written here. Right? Otherwise, we're going to have um, some other match arm, so an error. Okay. Actually, any read error would do it, right? But it's the special other type, not wood block. 
So we want to ignore wood block. NB error wood block does nothing. Right, and then we'll do fill match arms again. Uh, is this not going to let me do it? Nope. <laughs> I have to do it myself. So if we get to this, basically, let's turn the LED a different color and then loop forever. Yeah, right now I don't have multiple threads. Uh, but I understand that you, if you had multiple threads, you could just use one for the serial port. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a bunch of stuff in series because I only have one thread, right? So I'm pulling the USB, I'm scanning the keys, I'm pulling the serial port, and this should actually be refactored into another function. This is um, depending on what mode we're in, right? If we're the primary controller or not. This is handling data we receive from the peer. So this is like um, pull, well this is like handle, this is actually part of pull peer serial really, it should should be. Pull peer serial is read any data received, write any data to be sent, and then handle any data we received, right? But yeah, I'm doing it all in series right now, because there's only one thread. Okay, um, let's change the color. That's done in here. Just grab this code, yoink. And then back here, splat. Um, I don't know what color. We, have, we haven't used um, cyan, right? Okay, so if we get some kind of error here, we're just gonna turn the LED cyan and then infinite loop. So that'll tell me if I am getting serial port errors. Just basically trying to eliminate possibilities here, right? So we're programming the bottom board. But, uh, cool. I actually think I'm going to keep that color red for Bada. to tell me that it's in the midst of reprogramming itself. Bada. Okay, now we're programming the top one. Bada. It turned cyan there. You see that? I wonder if it's because this board reset. Let's reset that guy. Oh, that's weird. When I reset him, he errored out. So we're probably getting like a framing error or something like that when one board resets. Huh. But, uh... <laughs> it's f failing right away. Um, do I need to disconnect it now? Um, it's receiver's green one, so or. Yeah, let's disconnect the green one. Nope, it's stuck. Um, I guess when it's not connected, it's just but getting I'm... an error all the time. Oh, no, there it reset. But let's... Can I disconnect its receiver? Nope, I can't. I get an error. Alright, so it's kind of sort of dangerous to do that when... Um, it could be any error. So maybe i just be more specific about which error it is. Which errors could we be getting? We could be getting an overrun, a break, a parity, or a framing. The over overrun is the one I really cared about, right? Yeah, let me check for overrun. Let's eliminate overrun. Okay, that's what I want to do. So, if the error is NB... UART is normally high, so maybe when it resets, it goes low, confusing. Yeah, it's probably seeing it as a break, right? Only dangerous if you use unsafe. That's correct. 
um, other. This is where um, I'm going to have trouble figuring out the type because it's a little complicated, right? It's UART reader read error type overrun. UART reader. UART reader. Did I get it? No, not quite. Ambiguous. Use fully qualified syntax. Ah, uh, really? <laughs> Come on. All right, because this is just forwarded. Um, no, it's not. Is it in that? Wait, it's in UART, right? Uh, what trait are we looking at here? Hold on. I don't see the problem here. It's a specific type called read error type. Why can't I say read error type? Why did it need me? Why does it? Why doesn't? Why is that not acceptable? Does the input have pull-up resistors? No, I don't think so. I think in this, it's a function mode. Um. Well, I don't know. It depends on how the UART function of this microcontroller does things uh, for UART. Maybe they're pull-ups? I don't know. Is there no debug serial port? Uh, there is, but that's more work for me to set up. <laughs> up until now, I've been using the, U the USB's uh, serial class driver for my debug. So yeah, if I really get stuck, what I can do is hook up another serial port to some of the pins here and have it logged to that serial port. You don't need reader, you don't think? So is it, so is it that? What if I just say read error type and see if I can get it to figure it out? Quick fix. Okay, so it's qualify as UART read error type. And then that has a problem in that it's mismatched. Expected read error, found read error. Okay, so there's another layer. Like this, right? No? <laughs> oh, it's a struct. Right, because there was um, a discarded part part right so i would say dot dot i don't care and this was error type right and then um i can just say ignore all the other errors Is this the correct syntax, or do I need to say, like, air type if air type equals overrun? Think I need pull up resistors, otherwise, you get errors when you unplug the connection. Um, I'll just get a break, right? But I'm gonna ignore those in a second. I think I'm just gonna use the built-in bootloader to reboot this because it's gonna be flaky but, uh, so flash the top guy but, uh, but, uh, and he's good but, do the second uh, thing with this uh, same thing with this guy but, uh, flash but, uh, but, uh, all right so then um let's try it out Program, please. But, uh, okay, so he's still in 
the white state, which means he didn't receive an overrun. So it's not overrunning the FIFO. Could it be a, one of those other errors like parity? Uh, possibly. We're not receiving any, we're not receiving any overruns. It didn't overflow the shift register. Then what could it be? Could it be that, okay, I might need to try a slower baud rate. Wait a minute. Hold on. What happens when we receive the last sector? Oh, I think I know what it is. We're not waiting for the other guy to receive all of it. So we haven't drained our FIFO out completely. Ah. <sighs> After we receive the last sector, we need to like pause for a little bit to let our FIFO drain out to the other guy. Then we can go reprogram. Okay, I know what it, I think I know what it is. I, let me see if I can explain it to you guys, and maybe you'll agree or you won't. So, um, when we get to this um, commit state, we turn our LED red and commit to reprogram. This never exits, right? So we were we were ready to commit, but the other guy maybe hasn't received the last byte of the last sector. He's still in receiving the program, waiting for us to, you know, flush out our FIFO. But we're not ever going to be able to flush out our FIFO because um, we never return from this function. The only way our FIFO completely gets flushed out is over here, where we write it. We never get a chance to do this all the way to the end. So I'm going to add another state in there called, um, like, wait before commit or something. So, like, um, like, delay before commit. And we need to retain the program size because that's needed by the commit stage. Okay, so then we'll go add a match arm. So we don't do anything if we receive more bytes. We stay in that state. Right? I hope you guys agree that this is probably the, the bug. Because <laughs> I think it is. Add another match. Okay. I have these sort of in the wrong order. Um, let's move these back into the correct order. Okay. We just need to do something here. Let's pick another color to light up for that. Um, and we'll always light it, just like if we were going to commit. I'm going to choose purple for that delay stage so we can actually see it happen. So that's going to be um, 255, 0, 255. Right? So how do we know when to go to the commit state? We have to know when that time elapsed, which I guess we can monitor it in new, right? Or not new, uh, next for this actually it can't um scratch that let's go back i can do it when one of these yeah that's what i'll do in the um run we have these timers right so what i can do is i can um when we get to that state we'll start a timer. And when that timer elapses, we'll move to the other state. Where to put that? I guess we could put it anywhere here, right? Yeah, because we have it available. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That face when your baud rate is too high. <laughs> so I don't need this for any other purpose. Why don't we just set, yeah, set up a timer. Actually, I don't even need to set up a timer here. I can just move this code here. Ah, uh, wait, no. It has to persist up through the loop. Okay, so we'll say this timer 
if set up is used to transition to the programming commit state after um, an appropriate delay. In order to um, com ensure uh, that our peer has also received the complete program. Okay, so it will need to be none at first because it's an option. So this will be the um, commit program, a commit delay timer. That's what I'm going to call it. So what we'll do is we'll detect if we're in that state where we're delaying and we don't have the timer, we'll set it up. If we're in that state we're delaying and we do have a timer and that timer has expired, then we move to the commit state. And we can do that um, anywhere here. Why don't we just do it down here? Um, handle the state transition from delay before commit. Handle the programming state transition from delay before commit to commit. It's probably not worded the best, but you know, that's okay. So if let I can't remember my own type names. Serial, okay, that's a bad, we'll have to rename that. <laughs> right now it's called serial input state. Um, it should be like programmer state. Delay before commit um, size. Equal borrow self, well, borrow, um, Serial input state, right? We'll say if let some timer equal um, whatever I called it, this one, commit delay timer. else oh that was uh my son yeah you heard him he's behind me playing some game and sneezing occasionally i guess so that you can hear them <laughs> and doran says bless you <laughs> i passed it along for you and okay so if we do have a timer we want to check it right how do i check it i call wait which is a misnomer, right? But that's okay. Um, if timer dot wait, how come this is not working? What type is timer here? It's of an unknown type, probably because I have a bug. Um, but the state we're waiting for is okay, right? If let okay equal timer wait, Then, yeah, then we just set the new state. Serial input state equals. Commit, right? Size. Oh yeah, it doesn't know the type of timer like because we are here's where we want to set it right. Um, let commit delay timer e equal some 
and then here we're going to um put in a bracket let mute timer equals that and then this is timer start I'll just put hard coded a, a second in there right and uh timer Does it still not know the size? Annotations are needed. Oh, because I have a let. Uh, that shouldn't be there. There we go. Now it should be be able to figure out the type. Still no? Consider giving it an explicit type. Doesn't it know the type? It's a countdown. Why can't it figure that? I guess it's not smart enough to figure that out. Or I have another error. So let's just... Give it a type and see what kind of error I get. Oh, it's option timer. Okay, here's the actual bug. Oh, yeah, because we have to dereference it, it's borrowed. And then this has to be mutable, right? Well, this should be like as mute. There we go. So now I can remove the type annotation. I, for some reason, like I prefer not to have type annotations on my types. And maybe it's because I can mouse over and see the type if my program's correct. But I, I this might I might be going to an extreme with that. Oh, it needs it. <laughs> okay, here's an here's an example where it actually needs to know the type. Okay, well you you can you can have the type this time. Maybe I go overboard on not having types annotated anyway, right? So that's fine. Wait. It's never constructed. Oh, because we constructed and commit right now. Um here. So this should be delay before commit. There. So once we receive all the program, we go into the delay before commit state. Okay? And then in the, in the delay before commit state, we're not doing anything if we receive more input. We're turning the NeoPixel um, purple. And we construct a timer, and if we have that timer, or we construct a timer here, and if we have the timer, once it expires, we go to the commit state, right? And when we get into the commit state, uh, we don't receive any, we don't do anything if we receive more input, but, and we turn the pixel red, and then we finish programming. Okay. I feel confident about this. So this should force an extra second delay between receiving the program and then flashing. So um, this should be safe to program, right? From here. But, uh, I didn't see it go... Oh, right. We haven't built burned in the right program. So if I do it again... It should go purple and then red. Okay, there's a some this this has happened occasionally where it, there's a delay in connecting. I should like take a drink while I'm waiting for it to connect. <laughs> It has something to do with my Windows machine and its USB enumeration. Or sometimes it's just like, okay, there it goes, it's connected. Okay, it did go purple, but it went back to green. Wait, why would it go back to green? <laughs> but, uh... It went back to the normal state, I guess? Hold on. Yeah, it um, went back to green, flashing green again. 
Oh, wait. The primary board always flashes green. Normally. Okay, so then... The timer either um, never expired. Yeah, I think the net timer is not expiring then. So I have a bug in that code. Also, I should stop it. It should not blink when it's in that state. Um... We should, in the, where we blink, we should check to make sure the state is not, it should only blink in the normal state, right? Here, it should only, so if let serial input state normal equal borrow serial input state. So only blink in the normal state, right? Take a shot every time you have to wait. <laughs> It'll be fun for you. <laughs> oh, the drinking games we could invent. Okay, so there's probably a bug in the how I set up that timer, right? This thing. So the timer starts at none, right? So when we're in our poll, when, when we're idle, if we see we're in that delay state, um, which we should, we, we, which we were, right? Because it was turning the LED purple for a little bit. Um, it won't be some, it'll start out none. So it'll, it'll make a timer and start it on a um, second countdown storing it in that variable and then the next time through it'll just call wait and if the wait returns okay just verify wait returns okay when it's done right um show implementations here yes oh it does It does reset the timer. Does that matter? So it'll, it'll say okay once and then the next time it won't say okay. But this should immediately go to the commit state. And then that should trigger um, when it goes into... Oh, where is it? Maybe... Okay, where did I put the code where it transitions to program? Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's stuck in the commit state and it never um, did anything about that. Oh, yeah. It's only if it got more input. Okay, so I need to move this. <laughs> the, yeah. Um, we won't get here unless we receive more input, So, which we won't. So I need to move this over to where we go into that state. Right here. Right here. There. Do that. <laughs> so go into the commit state, make the pixel red, and complete the flash programming uh, it's being borrowed but we don't need it anymore so oh I need it here for the size and here so we just need to copy the size let size equal size I'm, it might seem weird it, it's just that I'm shadowing that old variable so that I can release the borrow on the serial input Right, it's never used. Oh, we don't even need that state. I see. We don't need the state because we never escape from here. That's interesting that the compiler figures out that we, ne we never use it. So we don't need the commit state. Yeah, because we'll never leave here. Okay, cool. So let's just delete it. <laughs> we never get there, so why have it? Right? In fact, I could rename the delay before commit, commit, All right? Why not? Let's just do it. What's the other warning here? Oh, yeah, infinite loop. Um, but we're not, re maybe I can remove this code because that's never happening. Yeah, let's get rid of it. We don't need that. So this becomes simpler. It becomes a let, if let okay bytes. Okay, 
so yeah, I want to rename this back to commit. So F2 commit there. Let's review. So if we receive the last bit of the program, we go to the commit state, but we don't actually finish reprogramming yet. Right? If we get more input, we just we just ignore it. Now, if we're processing serial input, we oh, uh, I should move this then, right? Oh, this is after next returns, right? So if when we get to the commit state the first time, we'll turn the LED to um, violet. Actually, I might as no, yeah, violet. We're turning it to violet or purple. And then when we get back to our idle loop, um, if we find ourselves in that commit state, then we see, do we have a timer? Not yet. So we set up one. And then every time, every time after that, we go into here and it won't be okay because it won't have elapsed a second yet. But when it does, we turn the LED red and we reprogram. And then that reboots. I like it. Let's try it. <laughs> I feel like I um, am making this overly complicated. We'll see. But, uh, I never saw it go violet. Oh, because um, I need to program it twice, right? <laughs> it has the program now that will turn it violet, so let's run it again. But, uh, no, I never saw it. Wait. But, uh, that was weird. Hold on, what did I just see? Did it program it twice? But, uh, no, it just did it once. I guess I was confused at what I was seeing before. So one more time, right? But, uh, oh, it was stuck on green. I think because I never gave it a color for when I was programming. Right, I should, I was only doing that for the secondary board. Okay, let's fix that. I um, remember I had it go through different colors, but only if it was the secondary board. These things, right? I should remove these. This one I'll keep because that's the normal state. We um, We turn it green when it's normal. It doesn't blink. Okay, but I'm going to remove this. Um, when it's programming, we want both boards to, s to show that. And same thing here. Yeah, okay. That's what confused me. I feel like I'm almost done and this is going to work. I have confidence. Program it, please. But, uh... Okay, now let's see if the LED states make sense. Because it goes white, then violet, then red. But, uh, and then it reboots and it's blinking. Perfect. Let's try the secondary board. Or the let's but, switch boards. Uh, Need to get the program over to this board, right? But, uh, um, I feel like I should disconnect the serial port before I do this. Which one was which again? Transmit is, for that one is yellow, so remove the yellow one. Okay. Hey there, Clayman. We're um, having one board program the other here. <laughs> but, uh... Okay, now connect the two boards together. So if I did everything right now, both boards should... Um, program themselves, but just to make sure it's a clean state, let me disconnect both. But, uh, and now clean connect both. But, uh, right, secondary board does not, does not blink, primary board does. And then here's where we're gonna, here's the, here's the test. They both go white. That one went violet, that one stayed white though. But, uh, okay, so, hmm. <laughs> 
I was hoping that when that one went violet, that this one would be receiving the rest of the program and then go violet too, but it didn't. Let's reset him. Wait. Oh, he's he keeps his old color. Let me pull his power for a second. Oh, on. <laughs> I should have it like turn itself off. It should go black if it's the secondary board, right? Okay. White, white. Okay. It maybe I'm not waiting uh, long enough. Maybe I need to wait more than one second. We can have it, um, hold on, let's keep this one off for now. I can increase the time, um, in run, right? This, how about we go to like five seconds to be extra safe? I don't think this is it, but just, just to make sure. Okay, so it should stay in the wait that violet state for um, five seconds now when I tell it to program. White, white. Purple, white. It's still purple. That's still white. Red, white. And then reset blinking. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter that I wait five seconds. He's still waiting to receive. So white means he's still waiting to receive the rest of the program. He never does for some reason. It would be cool if we did get log messages from the secondary board, so maybe I should spend some time on that. In order to get messages back to the primary board, the logger for the secondary board needs to have access to that UART. So let me think about that. How hard would that be? Either I work on that or I keep hitting my head against the wall on this problem. Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit more time looking through the code, looking for obvious problems. So, um, we pull the USB, right? We get some data from the host. We put it in our receive buffer, but we also put it into this ring buffer to send to the secondary board. So both boards should be receiving the same input. Process serial input on the primary board happens there. On the secondary board, it happens here. When these bytes come in and we're not the primary controller and we receive something from the peer. How big is the program and how long does it take to transfer over the URT? It's pretty quick. I think most of the time is actually spent programming the flash. It's about, um, well, we can look. Um, in this window. Target. Thumb. Release. So it's 62,212 bytes. At 115 kilobob, what is that at, at that speed? I need a calculator for this. So, 115200 bits per second divided by, what is it, 10 bits? No, it's 10, right? There's a start, 8 data, and a, and a parity. So 11,000 bytes per second, so five seconds? Is that how long it's been taking? I can run it again and see. Um, let's keep this one powered off so it doesn't get confused. Let's time how long this takes. 1,001, 1,002, actually it only took two seconds. But, uh... I never noticed this before. We're getting something from the peer. 
and it's not powered. Rogram H. This must be the raw data from the program. I wonder if it's because um, it's like echoing back across the wires because this isn't powered right now. So I must be wrong in my math. It's 62,000 bytes and it's only taking like two seconds to transmit at 115 kilobaud. So I must, I must have done my math wrong. Either that or it might be picking a, a higher... I bet you it's picking a... No, it's not picking a higher baud rate. I, I hard-coded it in, in this program. Where did I put that? Right here. 115,200. I mean, it, it might just be doing it too fast. Okay, so one thing I could do is lower the baud rate between the boards and then lower it even further from the host, right? Let's let's keep the baud rate between boards high and let's just lower the baud rate from the host so that it that the secondary board should always be able to keep up. So that's easy enough. I can just change this that number I was just looking at. Um back here. I can just change this number. What's another popular baud rate? Let me look at this one for ideas. It was when we set it up here. So let's try 57.6. Okay, so this should be noticeably slower to um, reprogram the board. No, that was still as fast. Why would it be so fast? But, uh... Maybe it's not really setting that baud rate correctly. So there's a way I can test that, right? I can make it really slow on purpose. Like 9600 bond. Like what if it's not actually setting, setting the baud rate to that, right? What if it's going much faster? I think it is going too fast. But, uh... That it can't be going at 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 eighty ninety six hundred baud. It must be going much faster. So, what's wrong with this then? Is it not actually using this baud rate? I'm being raided by blog with a party of one. Did you build? I didn't have to build. I'm I'm um. Every time I do the program, it compiles and builds it. And it's this program that is uh, has that baud rate in it. Right there. Um, why would it not use the correct baud rate? Could it be I need to use... It might be that I have to actually call baud rate? So it's not being accepted by the new? Maybe? Yeah, maybe. That's weird that they would put it in the new, but not... But, but also have a function to call it. Let's try it. No, it's still really fast. It shouldn't be that fast to load um, 50,000 bytes into it. I don't trust it. 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, the device manager. Maybe I need to force it there. I should be... My understanding is that USB serial ports, the host can set the rate, right? But maybe for some reason it's not. It's set to 9600. I don't get it. <laughs> it shouldn't be that fast. It's 50,000 bytes. It should take a few seconds, right? Can I set it, like, really low? Like, 1,200? Let's move off to the side here. What if I set it to really slow? 1,200. Like, slower than my old modem from the 90s. <laughs> No, it, it, it's ignoring the baud rate. It's just... I don't know what rate it's sending it at, but it's really fast. But, uh... I set it here. I don't know if that has any effect. Let's see. No, it's just... Going at whatever speed it wants, I guess. But, uh... I don't know what to say. I don't trust this library now. What does this do? It just stores it there. Where is it? What uses it? Okay, Windows in Win for Windows Condors it calls set baud rate on DCB whatever that is. Okay, that's just storing it. It's putting it into a DCB struct. So I'm I guess this is going to some Windows API that's setting the baud rate, but for some reason it's not doing it. I don't know. Do you think it might be in the advanced support settings? Okay, I can look again. I thought it was software controlled. All right. Advanced ports, advanced settings. Use FIFO buffers. Huh. Wonder what these are in use by. Could it be that? What if we turn that off? Keep that window up for a while. Thousand one, one thousand. Nope. Super fast. But, uh. Device is working properly. I don't know. Hey, good morning, Ramy. How are you today? Could it be in one of these USB properties? I don't see anything about baud rate anywhere here. Slightly better. That's great. You see a lot of baud... You are a few years ago. Always a pain in the ass when it comes to baud rate. Okay, maybe I have no control over it, and it is overwhelming the serial port. So, one idea I have is that we can wait for... Um, we, can, we can wait for an echo back of every byte we send. That's the most crude way, right? Before we send another byte, we wait until we hear that byte back. Problem with waiting to receive something back is if I don't have the two halves connected, 
then it'll be waiting forever. Right? thing that bothers me is um, we never saw an overrun. Oh, wait. I, there's another place where it could overrun. It could be overrunning my circular, my uh, ring buffer. Yeah. There's not much I can do about that. The only way I can, the only way that I can um, do this without something more sophisticated like um the the problem is the first board is going to receive it very fast and it has to store it into flash because it, it, it might not have enough ram so it has to program it into the staging area if we were had a way to detect if the second board was present we would know to wait for it then we can go into a special state where we're just feeding the second board the data as fast as it can receive it, reading from our staging area. Yeah, I'm thinking that could do that. I mean, right now I can just assume that the second board is always there because it's always plugged in now. Um, so we receive all the program, put it in the staging area, then go to another state where we feed the other board as fast as it can receive it, or basically as fast as we can transmit. And then um, when we've sent all of those bytes, then we commit. Then I don't need that timer anymore. That's one nice side effect of it. Okay, let's try that. Um, something to try, at least. Program's doing pretty well, Raimi. So I got the two boards somewhat talking to each other, but I've discovered that this USB serial port is much faster than the UART between the two boards right now. And I believe it's overflowing my the ring buffer I use to communicate to basically when I program this board I want it to forward the program to this board but this one's receiving it much faster than it can forward to this guy so I need to change it so that instead of trying to, to have it keep up that it just receives all of the program and then it sends it at a much slower speed to the second board and then when it's done then it then it commits to its own reprogram and then this one also do the same yeah, it's just making my, it's going to make my state machine even more complicated is all. Um, yeah. All right, let's redo this. So that means we have another state. Um, let's call it forwarding program. I need two variables in it. size and offset right and that goes between commit and receiving okay I can do this this we can do this I have confidence again see the confidence keeps me motivated although it's past midnight I need to get some sleep but I can do this we can do it forwarding program this is transforming the state correct so we're going to want to mutate this actually in this state we don't move at all so that should just return itself we're going to ignore input at this point yeah it's down here where I got to do some work Right here. Mm. 
no, not here. <laughs> um, but no, this is this was to set the LED color, right? So let's pick another color. Actually, we can use. Yeah, commit can use that color. That's what that's what I can do. Um, yeah, we won't bother doing anything in commit. We'll do this in forwarding. Like so. So it's going to progress the same way. Green to blue to white and then to purple and then red when we're actually co committing and we can't talk to the serial ports anymore. Right? Okay. Then, um, didn't I have another match down here somewhere? I don't need this block of code. Goodbye. In run. Oh, it was this. Yes. So this goes away because we don't want this commit delay timer anymore. All right. So here's where we do our different work here. Um, Oh, I have to change this and I have to change where we're forwarding. So we forward in pull USB here. So I got to move this out. Um, in fact, I don't even want a transmit buffer anymore. I want to feed the FIFO directly from that state. So I'm going to get rid of this transmit buffer pair completely. It's gone. We still have a ring buffer for receive, but we should be able to keep up with the receiver. Okay, so that the ramification is that is that those don't we don't need right. So this effectively gets moved down to here somewhere. I'm just gonna put it here as a placeholder. Just throttle the input speed of the first one. Um, that's another idea, actually, Ramy. Um, I could use flow control on this guy. I could say, hey, hey, PC, stop sending me stuff. I'm still trying to keep up with my secondary board here. <laughs> so if this doesn't work, maybe I do that where I just use um, flow control. Because you can throttle. There's like X on, X off controls you can do. Okay, this is forwarding program. Um, this will need to match, actually. And it will need to mutate the state, too. So let's move this out. Remove that. Put that here. Put an arrow there. Down to here. Okay, now... Oh, wait. I don't need this anymore. Yeah. And that can go away. Cool. So, if... Yeah, we are matching. We are missing one. This is going to assign back to serial input state. I need to fill the match arms. Can I do something like state at underscore just to say if we are in any other state then we then we don't change state we've written as just state okay then there we go cool so we we go to violet saying that we're forwarding the program to our peer that should change the other guy to white actually um so we have to send him the string that says program and then we have to send him the four bytes which is the size and then we have to send in the complete program right so the complete program's from flash 
Okay, that means that I need um, more state here. I need to know... Um, I guess I can just have a vector of prefix. The prefix is going to be the, the string program, carriage return, line feed, and then the 4-byte size. And then after we send that, then we're sending a copy from our staging area. So vector of bytes. Okay. Yeah, so we're no longer doing this here. All right. We have no timer. Okay, I want to keep this around. This is what we do when we... Um, are ready to actually commit our program. Actually, you know what? I just thought of something. I just thought of something. Um, I'm going to have to... Um, right. We're going to go straight to commit if we are the secondary board and we are in this um, process serial input, right? Um, where is it? Not here. Did it, was it in next? Yes, right here. Um... Yeah, we don't want to do we only want to do that for the primary board. If it's a secondary board, we just want to commit. And this doesn't know that. So, hmm. Oh, wait. We have commit. Right. Okay, then I know what to do. So, yeah, back here. If we get to the commit state, we commit right away. If, if we're the primary board, if self dot is primary controller, we, we, um, go into the forwarding program state. Um, so actually, uh, this can never happen here, so I'm just going to not do anything. I'm going to move this to here and get rid of this. We'll have it just do nothing. And then um, there's an else. If we are the secondary board, we immediately program. Okay, this needs to have a size here. Shoot, I just thought of something. <laughs> this is this is the wrong place to put this. Um we're supposed to put this back up. Um Yeah, it doesn't go here. We're I'm gonna move this. Yeah. I don't know, this is getting complicated. It should go here, actually. Uh, oops. Oops, oops. I need the whole match arm, actually. There. Right here. So, if we reach the commit state, and this is our main run loop, if we're the primary controller, we go into the secondary, we go into the forwarding state. 
So I need to put that there. Um, we need to fill in this information here. So it's forwarding program, right? With empty braces, and then I can expand that. Fill struct fields. Okay, but prefix, here's where we put in like, um, can I just do format? I have to put the binary string P R O G R A M carriage return line feed, and then I need to like append to that f the four byte size. So let's just construct this incrementally. So um, let prefix equal. Mm. Can you do to vec with from this? Yeah, to vec. Okay, and then I just append the to the prefix, right? Um, append. Didn't I have something that would turn? Oh, like it was from or two le byte two be bytes, right? Or is it le be? It was in the other program. That's where it was. Two le bytes. Thought it was in here. No, be bytes. Big Indian. There it is. This is what I wanted. <laughs> so. For byte in size dot two b e bytes prefix dot push. Okay, and then that's this prefix. Size we got up there. Offset is zero. Cool. If for the secondary controller and we get to the commit state, we immediately program ourselves. In fact, this part we already have done, so I'm gonna remove that. Yeah, I wanna have the LED controls up here exclusively. So um, that means here's where we put the purple one. Um, no, this we never get to, it's impossible to get to that. In fact, let me put, well, let's just leave it nothing. Yeah, so remove this because um, this is when we transition into the commit state. We're either going purple because we're, we need to tell the other guy, or we are we'll go red because we're, we're the secondary and we're going to program immediately. Um, this falls out of this function and gets to the run down here where it says, okay, are we forwarding? Then set up to forward. And if we're the secondary, then we flash right now. Cool. So then if we're for the forwarding, I don't need to set this color. Um, what do we do? Oh, yeah, we just keep trying to write. That's what we do. So first we try to write from the prefix, right? So if this is mutable too, right? Forwarding program. Prefix is empty. Then we're sending the actual um, body of the program. Otherwise, we're sending the program string and then the size. So sending the... F right. So sending the... Stuff would be self dot um, Did I actually store the serial port up here? In self? Or what did I put there? Pure serial, right? 
Yes, so we're accessing that directly. Where did we do that before? Find all references. Right, did I keep that code the right raw? I didn't. <laughs> I deleted it. Oops. Okay, no no problem. We can we can do it again. It's gonna be self dot peer serial. Dot write raw. Yeah, so it we try to write everything and then we get back the leftovers, right? So we're, the everything here would be forwarding prefix as slice. And then um Right, we say if let um, okay leftovers equal that isn't it one thirty? No, it's only twelve thirty, but I do need to finish soon because I got asleep. <laughs> The last few streams, I've stayed up way too late. <laughs> I feel like, just like I felt the one Wednesday night, I felt like, I feel like I'm getting close to the end, and like, two hours later, <laughs> I actually finished. Sleep is for the week! Okay. What I want to do is compute consumed, right? Consumed equals the amount of data we have minus the leftovers. minus left overs dot length and then we want to drop that from the prefix so for a program prefix drain dot dot consumed right and then out of here we just emit the forward we just emit this again Actually, we can just do that here. This will be different though, but I'll put that there for now. What's this error that we're getting? What's this error? If might be missing an else. It's not missing an else. Oh, I guess I can. it's telling me I can do this instead. No, that's not it. I do need to have an else. Um, wait, what? Okay, yeah, there is an else there. Yeah, this needs to have... an else. This means we couldn't write anything, so... this remain... actually, hold on. This goes here, and I get rid of the else. Like that. Okay, now it's happy. And I'm happy. Uh, so this will write the prefix out, right? Because we'll try to write it all. It'll tell us how much we got. If we wrote anything, it'll tell us how, how, tell us how much we couldn't write. We figure out how much we actually wrote. We drain that out. And we update the state. Next time through, it'll be empty if we actually finish writing the prefix. And then we're writing from the staging area. So... We'll need to form a slice from the staging area, given the offset into um, that we're reading from, up to the size, right? So I can I can make the slice as big as I want. So that's what I'm going to do. So um, actually, then I can move this leftovers thing out. Right? Is it going to be the same in both of these? It's going to be the same in both of these, but the logic's slightly different, so... Yeah. Just, we're just going to copy for now. <sighs> okay, copy, paste. It's... The, to construct the slice is going to be a little bit more complicated. I need access to the staging area. I don't know if I actually imported it here. 
Um, what's this? I don't need that. That was looks like an accident to me. What did I import from crate uh, flash? The sector size, but we also need um, the flash staging area. Where did I put? Where did I define that? Did I define it here? Ah, flash staging offset. But we'll also need the flash base. But I am importing that. No, I'm not. Let's import that. Okay, so it's flash base plus flash staging offset plus our our own local offset. So it's um something about um from raw parts or something. This thing. This is how we construct a slice from a raw pointer. <coughs> Paste that. Yeah, so um, the length is going to be forwarding program dot size minus offset. Size minus offset. The address will be because um, it wants a pointer, right? Yeah. So it's going to be some pointer as a pointer to constant u8, and that pointer will be um, flash base plus flash uh, staging offset plus a forwarding program offset. And of course this is unsafe, so I need to put this whole thing in uns actually I can just do this part. Let slice equal and then can I say uh, equal unsafe? And then put this part in there. Okay, one of these, are they both U32s? Okay, it wants um, this converted to a U size. Okay, now what's wrong with this part? Right, I'm not actually returning the next state. Yeah, okay, so once we get leftovers, compute the consumed, um, is going to, well, I should actually get that total, like, um, amount left or remainder. Well, two unprogrammed. I, hey there, Romania Heat. I'm struggling with words. Oh, hey there, Oblivioner. What am I working on? I'm working on a keyboard. Today I'm working on getting this one of these to program the other so that they program together. And I have to forward the program that it receives to the other one and then wait um, wait until it gets received and then it can reprogram itself. And the logic is fairly complicated. And like always, if you've watched me before, what I tend to do is I write really horribly complex um, messy code and then I get it to work and then I go refactor to clean it up okay so at this point I just need a name for like how many bytes we have left to program bytes left to send equals this mess because I need to reference it twice so I put it there and so the consumed equals bytes left to send minus leftovers length. And then what I do with consumed is I add it to the offset. Plus equals consumed. Now, at the final thing, it's if the offset is equal to the size, we're done. Right? Otherwise, we're not. <laughs> we're either done or we're not. If we're not done, 
it's the same state we transition to. Otherwise, we're done. Um, actually, if we're done, we can just reboot at this point. I think. Yeah, it'll take us some time to program the flash, at which point the peripheral would have pushed this out, right? So it should be safe enough here. God, I hope so. <laughs> to reboot. So, um... I feel like that should be its own function, where we put it in here, right? Actually, where did I put it? It's in Flash, called Commit Reprogram. Where are we calling it from? There. I hit it right here. We just need to do that. Call that. Right there. And it never returns. So we get the size from the forwarding program. And what the heck? What's my error now? If maybe missing an else. I don't see that. Um, okay. I don't see the error here. <laughs> oh, oh, right. The outer thing is missing an else. Yes, so, hmm. Actually, any way we slice it, no pun intended, I can just put this outside the if, and that satisfies it, and I don't need this else. There we go. Uh, why can't I advance offset by consume? Probably because offset's U32, and this is a U size? Right. Actually, then, bytes to send was a U, oh, it was a, it was a U size, okay. There. Down to one error. Okay, prefix, okay, that needs to be mutable. I always forget to do that. And now we're just down to warnings. What's this warning? Oh, right, we don't care about the size at that point. One more warning. Yes, we never needed to make a ring buffer for the transmit peer. Okay. <laughs> Should I just build it and run it, or should I review it first? I think I should review it. It's this horribly complex. But if we get to this point where we're we're ready to commit our program, right? We see, are we the primary controller? No, then we just flash, right? If we are the primary controller, we turn our LED to purple which is my color to signify, hey, we're, we're forwarding our program to the other guy. We construct the correct sequence to tell him to program, which is program and um, character turn line feed, push the four byte size, and then um, take that vector and put it into our state forwarding program. So then the next loop around will be in the forwarding program state. And if the, pre the prefix isn't empty yet, so we go into the else, and we're trying to write our prefix out. Every time it accepts some bytes, we drain them out of the prefix. Eventually we're done sending the prefix, so we're back up to here, and it's empty, so the bytes left to send is the entire program minus how far we are into it. We construct a slice that points into our own staging area where we've written the program, and we try to write it all, and it'll only take a tiny portion of it, so we figure out what that is, and we advance our offset by that amount. Once we get to the very end, we're done, because the other guy has everything he needs to reprogram himself. Okay, I think this is good. So I'm going to build this, and go over this window. Actually, I'm going to reset this guy. Uh, that's not the way to reset him. <laughs> that's 
the wrong wire. That's the correct wire. So he's reset. Reprogram. Okay, so then he should be able to reprogram him now. Let's see it. Let's see him do it. Goes white. Now he goes white. It's taking much longer because the serial port is slower. But, uh, he reset because he was done. Oh, okay, but he's still waiting. Hmm. Don't know what to do about this. He the the first one looked like he went through the motions, right? He went through the motions to reprogram the second, but maybe he reset too quickly. I don't know. It's hard because I don't get any feedback from this guy about how many bytes he has received from the primary guy. But it it did go at the proper speed this time. That was encouraging. In fact, I kind of want to time that. It's sh it's it's if it's at 115 k baud. So um, let me calculate how long that should take. Again, it was like eight seconds or something. Uh, let's get the program size again. So 62,468 bytes, right? One one five two zero zero, and it's at eight data bits, one stop bit, and there's a start bit, right? So is that is it nine or ten bits total? Let's just assume it's ten. So divide by ten, that many bytes per second. Um, divide by sixty two four six eight, and then invert it. So five point four seconds, right? So that's how long it should take at that bit rate. Let's see if it actually takes that long. Uh, not this window. This one. One thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, one thousand four, one thousand five, one thousand six, one thousand seven, one thousand. But, uh... Okay, so it was a little bit longer. So maybe it's eleven bits instead of. 10. I could run the time command, but there's still some slop because it is some eye to finger delay, right? Actually, if I, he's still waiting to receive something. So let me check something. If I just go through the motions again, he'll send more data to him. Oh, now he's programming. Wait, no. He shouldn't be showing purple. Wait, that's a bug. That's a bug. It should never go to purple. He's a secondary. He should never... Okay, I need to track that down then. Does it actually boot? I guess so. Actually, let me check to make sure he didn't get hosed. Actually, no, he shouldn't have gotten hosed, right? He is hosed. Okay, so that that one's been destroyed, so I need to recover it. Um, hold down button. Brother? Reset. Flash. Brother. Okay, back to normal. <laughs> Brother. Brother? That makes me think that he was programming something, and it... Um, well, it'll be garbage near the end, right? If he didn't receive all of his program. You're back. Welcome back, Remy. Okay, I need to track down who, like, how did that one turn purple? It shouldn't have turned purple, so let's find NeoPixel. This thing. All references. Okay. So that's green. 
that's blue, that's white, there's purple. But that's only if is primary controller is true. Otherwise it should have gone red. Continue. Off, uh, on green, and oh, there it is, purple. But that's, again, primary controller. And this shouldn't actually do it. I shouldn't have that there. Then is primary controller wrong? Only if USB is configured. Oh, wait, wait. Configure is the wrong state. It should be addressed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I had that wrong the whole time. It should be addressed. Because we'll be configured and fully functional even if it's not plugged in, right? So only if it's actually addressed should we say that we're the primary controller. So I need to independently flash that in, so let me... Um, let me just turn that off. Actually, it's better to... No, don't ever connect power and ground. I was about to do that. <laughs> don't ever do that. All right, control C. Yeah, that's, it's receiving back noise. Isn't that interesting, the noise it received? Wait, why is it stuck? Why is it solid on? Solid on tells me that I just picked the wrong thing. That it's not addressed. Because it will not blink unless it thinks it's the primary controller. So maybe that was correct. Then there's some other reason why it turned purple. Or I can't trust this state thing. Hmm. Maybe the second controller somehow wrongly considers itself as a primary. Yeah, I'm considering that, but um, I thought it might be I'm using the wrong state here. Hold, hold on, I gotta say goodnight to one of my kids, so I'll be right back. Look who wants to say goodnight. It's our snake. Our snake wants to say goodnight. Say goodnight, snake. Goodnight. Don't bite me, please. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a real snake. Well, he's close to the camera, so he looks big. I guess he is a big guy. Goodnight, <laughs> snake. Anyway, um, maybe I, yeah, so maybe this was correct to be configured. I guess we'll just try that again. Build that guy. So that means it's something else that... Or I was confused. Maybe I was just confused about what I was seeing. But, uh... Wait, it didn't do the right thing there. White, purple... Oh, right, because the last program was uh, thought it was secondary. Okay. Now, I got to program the other one independently, don't I? But, uh, but, uh, all right. Programming on both of these have the same state. Not a rattlesnake, it's a ball python. 
<laughs> you think I'd have a rattlesnake in front of my nose like that? Yeah, the ball pythons make pretty good pets. You just have to feed them um, rats, which can be frozen. You can give them frozen rats. They're okay with that. Okay, let's try this again, right? Okay, it's forwarding the program now. But, uh... but the other guy's still waiting. If I have it um, send more data... Okay, then this guy thinks he's programming. But, uh... Okay. Good night. He's, this guy's stuck now, I think. Right? Yeah, it's hosed. <laughs> I think it reset and then... Um, yeah, it reset and... It, so it got a corrupted program. So the program's getting corrupted, but, uh, I think. So let me recover the... But, uh, that way. There we go. So maybe we're sending too fast. I can lower the baud rate. It could be that I'm just using too high of a baud rate between the two. Do they become massive? Uh, maybe a... How long would you say snack is? A meter long? Two meters? Two meters? A meter and a half? Like, like that. Two? Yeah, about maybe two meters long. Trying to use EU-friendly units. Four or five imperial feet. <laughs> so that would be under two meters. Yeah, trying to teach them meters. Yeah, think of, think metric. Okay, um... Lowering the baud rate, right? That is easy enough through a constant, um, but I have to do it on both boards. They have to match here. This is constant. Let's try something slower. Let's try really slow. <laughs> very something very conservative, right? Ninety six hundred baud. That'll actually take a while to send. Um, I'm just going to um, unhook it while I program it. Actually, then we'll get to see how long... It, like, then I don't want to program it uh, directly. I want to use the original programmer. But, uh... Flash. I didn't hold down the button long enough. But, uh, there we go. Flash, please. But, uh, Let me do the other end. But, uh, but, uh, many buddhas today. But, uh, but, uh, maybe I should make a shorter but, sound. Uh, what do you think? A shorter sound? Like, bup. Roughly two meters. Five feet is one and a half meter. There's another thing. You guys use the comma, and we use the dot to separate the whole numbers from fractional parts. You like the bada? Okay, here we go. It's receiving the program. Now it's sending it over. Sending it. You know, I could have it actually log how far it's getting. This is going to take a while, though, right? It's going to take ten times as long as pre previously. So if this also fails, then it's likely not a baud rate issue, it's some other bug. Right? Because it, now it's sending pretty slowly. Decimal makes more sense. It is the decimal point, right? 
Yeah, this is agonizingly slow. I hope I don't need to run it at the slower rate. I mean, it also could be these wires, right? These wires could be kind of noisy. While it's going, should I bring out the calculator and see how long it should take? So 90, what was it? 90 to 200? I can't even remember now. Oh, it's done. And the other guy's still waiting, so it's not that. 9,600 divided by 11, so that into... Sixty two three forty invert. So seventy one seconds. It did seem like a little bit over a minute, right? It is hard to tell. It looks like you're listing like numbers. Ten, one, ten, two. Yep, you're right. Well you gotta use the dot instead of the comma to separate yeah. It, yeah, it's backwards. <laughs> So let's run the programmer again. If I'm right, it'll just do what it did before, only much more slowly this time. Oh, it quickly finished the program there. Interesting. Well, this guy can, I can reset him. He, this one I have to recover, though. But, uh, so hold down the button while plugging it in. But, uh, and then um, run flash here. But, uh, All right. Um, I'm going to say that it has nothing to do with the baud rate, that there's some other bug that I'm missing. So let's boost it back up. And look for another bug. It could be on the receiver end, too. Although it's very unlikely because... We're just calling the same function just from two different places, right? We either... Are... Well, it's... It's the self-received, right? We're either re receiving it from the host serial port, or we're receiving it from um, this um, peer serial port. Yeah. So we get a slice back, we get its length, so that we can pull that number of bytes out of the ring buffer. We copy them into the self-received and then process. I mean that... We're not doing the loopback anymore. That looks fine to me. So, so what, it's the transmitter? Down here? Something wrong with this code. Well, I mean, it looks ugly, so there's probably something wrong with it, right? I know that it's sending the prefix because it goes through the motions of getting the word program, carriage return line feed, and then the four byte size. So it's either the four byte size is wrong or we're not sending the correct number of bytes over. Uh oh, are we getting back into the banning each other state? <laughs> You don't actually just call it hashtag? Hmm, <laughs> I can't stay up too late tonight, so I wonder if I have to, like, leave this for next time. The unfortunate thing is I can't stream for the next week. We gotta take a week off. So I'd really like to get this working tonight. It's just 10 a.m.? Yeah, for you. Can you magically transport sleep over to me so that like a, it's as if I had a good night's sleep and it's now 10 a.m.? That'd be great.
What happens if we try to write an empty slice here? Then it will just fall through and return nothing. Okay, so that's fine. Pick up the streaming search. I don't know, has, does, is Clayman the streamer now? Maybe Clayman was always a streamer and I just didn't know. And then I need to follow Clayman. Whoa, Clayman is a streamer. Here, I'll, I'm going to press that follow button. There we go. I'm a follower now of Clayman. Now Clayman will show up in my um, list of people who I might raid. Basically, I'll raid someone if I follow them. And they happen to be streaming when I stop. <laughs> That's like pretty much the only criteria I'll pick. I'll, uh, unless um, there aren't very many to choose from. And then I kind of get discouraged and I don't raid anybody. Yeah, I've been claimed. There we go. That's a great, that's a great use of that word. Okay. Prefix is empty. Bytes up to send is the program size minus the offset, which I set to zero, I hope. Bytes left to send. Okay. We try to send it. I mean, that should be safe. We're reading from Flash and writing to the serial port, right? Pulse equals consumed as U32. If the offset equals the size, then commit. If it's not, it falls through and, and then the state is updated to that. I don't know. Uh, follow this back out. I feel like I'm looking in the wrong place. Size comes from the commit size. Here's where we form the prefix. Program, character turn line feed. We push the size in big endian bytes. That should match the from BE bytes over here. Okay, I feel like to figure out what the heck is going on, I really do need to um, be able to see the serial log from the secondary board. Which means I have to do some some rework to um when I set up the logger it has to have that serial port resource so that it can write to it and then on the primary board when we receive bytes we would um just log them I think I'm actually already doing that right um no it's not here it's here. Yeah, we're all, we're showing them as peer and then a message, which we see sometimes when there's noise on the line, when it's not connected. Okay, so maybe it's not too hard. I just I need to get the correct serial port to receive the lo the the logger to send to the correct serial port. Okay, where is that logger setting up stuff? I can just look at logger. What does it take? Oh, it takes a ring buffer. Oh. Well, that makes it easier. That makes it much easier then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I just need to set up, oh, I had it before, but a TX buffer reader writer. 
that we only use if we are the secondary, and then I just always give that to the logger. Yeah, this is totally easier. Okay, then I can do this. Yeah. Transmit ring buffer. And we're going to give the writer to the logger. Right, so we're going to give one of the writers to the logger. It's going to depend on whether we're the primary. Oh, this is the problem. I don't, it doesn't know it boot up if it's the primary or not. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to do this. It, it, it won't know until the USB stack is set up and connected that, oh yeah, I'm the primary board. Wait, why doesn't why don't I just give both writers? And it can write to both. Oh, another way we can, can do it. I know what to do. <laughs> this um that serial port writer. Where did I make it? The serial port reader. We're not using that, right? If we're the secondary board. Okay, then I know what to do. Yeah, this never, we never get here because poll never returns anything, right? So we can, we can, if we're the secondary board, we can um, pull from this ring buffer and push out the serial port. Yeah, easy. In fact, it's almost exactly the same as this right here. And we are going to do this in run or pull pier serial. Yes, I'm going to do it exactly here. I'm going to say if we have the data in the serial port buffer and we are the secondary controller, try to write. sum of the data, Let's try to write the data to the peer serial port. So it'll be if not self dot is primary controller, then do that. But we don't write to host serial, we write to peer serial. And we don't write, we do write raw. And we don't match, we say if let uh, okay leftovers equal. Then um, it's, that, it's that same dance that I've been doing. where we um, do this um, drain stuff. Well, actually not the drain stuff, but I suppose this is the best representation of it. Okay, so then paste here. Let consumed equal um, a data size, data length, minus leftovers length. There we go. And then, yeah, then it's, then it's pull consumed. There we go. I did it. So now we'll get log messages from the secondary board, I hope. Is this right? If some data, peak the host serial buffer reader. If there's some data, then try to write it to the pure serial port. If we have, with the leftovers, figure out how much we actually wrote and then pull those. Yeah, that'll, that'll work. Hope has returned. I'm just going to be on the conservative side and flash both boards. 
the old way. Ba -da. And then unplug it. Ba -da. Plug in the other one. Ba -da. Ba -da. Ba -da. Ba -da. Okay. So going over here. Oh, that's wacky. No. It's just because we had so many disconnections. Um, if I hit that key now... Oh, look! It worked! We're getting peer reports from the secondary board. I mean, it wrapped around the si side of the screen, but it worked. So now when I program, we should be, we should be getting um, information from the secondary board. So hold on. When I hit Control-C, program... There we go. Okay, it received... And it's, we see the programming the sectors. But, uh, it got... Uh, ooh, that's weird. So the primary board got all the way to F. Program size 62532. The peer got the 62532, but it only programmed through sector B. And then, and then it ended. What does that mean? Orange and Apple reports. Not pear, peer. <laughs> okay, this is progress. I'm glad I did that step. So we've, I, I verified, oh, oh, check it out. We have some data loss. Ah, we have data loss over that UART. Look at that. It says program. It missed some bytes, right? It missed the col a colon keyboard space p well and stars it missed this a string of that length of this length actually one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen it dropped 16 bytes somehow So if we're dropping bytes over that serial port, that could explain why um, we get to sector B and then that's all we receive. We're just dropping bytes, right? So I'll just reset this guy because he should boot back up. He doesn't boot back up. Why not? Oh, he's stuck. Why would he be stuck? Oh no, he's not stuck. Oh, because he doesn't flash his LED when he's a secondary board. I forgot to do that. He's supposed to turn off his LED, or maybe we pick a different color to blink. I should do like a blink a different color, like blue. That's what I should do. Okay. Um, Control C, please. There we go. Let's try again. But, uh, yeah, it it only got so far, and yeah, it again near the same spot it lost data. But I almost feel like um, it's because this got rammed through really fast, right? It could oh 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 um. It could have flooded that circular buffer again, that ring buffer. Maybe I just need to increase the size of the ring buffer. To get those messages back through reliably. It could actually, it could actually be on the primary board where it, it just dropped some of those, some of the data there. So that, that, that's maybe normal. I, I need to log more is what I need to do, right? Um, or I need to send it in smaller pieces? Or send it more... No, sending it more slowly didn't, ha didn't work. Oh, hold on. What if it's some of the bytes we're sending are being misinterpreted as flow control bytes? You know what I mean? Let me reset this guy.
Yeah, what if there are flow control bytes being misinterpreted? Because I'm sending it as raw binary, right? Remember how, like, they used to reserve certain bytes as, um, flow control? Um, yeah, I'm not sending any of these things, like... Flow control, right? Maybe I need to turn off flow control. Maybe flow control is on by default and it's using software flow control. What if it's something silly like that? Uh, how do I get back to... Where is that code? <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong project. The wrong project. Okay, back to here. Um, I have too much code and it's too late at night for me to think straight. So that was in new. Somewhat down here. Yeah, what is this? Baud rate, data bits, stop bits, parity, but is that it? I could send it ASCII safe or something like that, right? Where we just use the lower seven bits or even less, like I could send it hexadecimal. There's nothing that says I can't do that. I could send it as, um, I could just, I could just try to send it as, um, just masked so that the, so that it's, that the, that they're always safe ASCII characters and they won't be misinterpreted as flow control characters. Yeah, I don't remember what the flow control characters were, but I think they're like within the first 32 bytes of the ASCII table. That's my guess is that we're it's so we're somehow sending bytes that it's misinterpreting. X off and X on, yeah. So what if I always like turn on certain bits? Or just I I need to look at an ASCII table. I can't think of this in my head right now. I I just I, I don't need the program to be um Correct. I just need to, it to um, verify it actually gets through. If we want to avoid these characters here and only send these, it's got to be within 20 hex and 80 hex. So how would I map this? What if I just always send the same character all the time and we don't actually yeah that's the easiest we just send the correct number of characters we just send the same character so we flood the flash with like all zeros or something or all x's or something like that yeah i like that okay so where do we actually transmit that's what matters down here right right here it's this slice, right? So what if I combat out slice, right? And instead, we have a substitute slice. Hmm, trick, I was gonna make a, like an X. Actually, why don't we just send one character at a time? We just send one character at a time. Um, okay, it has to be a binary. Yeah, it's going to send one byte at a time. One byte per loop. Okay, this calculation is wrong now. So I need to hack that one. Actually, um... I can fix that without hacking it. Instead of bytes left to send, I can just make it slice.length. Right? So it will always be one, and this will either be zero or one. Easy. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Build that guy. 
Make sure he's reset. All right. And then program. Here we go. Control C, yes, program. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B. Nope, that didn't do it. But, uh... <laughs> That, that didn't fix it. So it's not misinterpreting flow control bytes. There's something else. Like, is there anything for me to figure out from this? It's like... That last one's 1000 hex, so... It just stopped receiving for some reason. And we were sending, I, I should watch carefully. Is it still sending? Okay, so it's still purple, still purple. And it's turning. But, uh, Actually, it didn't change red at all. I thought it, I thought it had to turn red when it's gonna program. Oh, I took that out. Dang, I need to put that back. Actually, it's just easy to toggle the power. <laughs> it's going to be just like Wednesday, where after two hours, I figure out, oh, that's what I did wrong. It's going to be like a character, like a one should have been a two somewhere. We figured out that this makes absolutely no difference, right? So I should just undo that. Oh, it was I, I should just put it back in here. Um, that's this is the exact point where we want to turn the LED red. Uh, where's the LED code? Here it is. Where's red? Here's red. Easy copy paste. Oh, my UPS is deciding to test its battery level right now. Huh. Hardly ever hear it happen when I'm actually sitting here. Yeah, let me... I'm just curious um, how long it's actually trying to send before it stops trying to send and if that correlates to what I'm seeing over here. So it's white, purple, 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 purple. Oh, wait a minute. We have to do that twice. <laughs> right, that was the old program executing. Now the new one. White, purple now. Purple, purple, purple. But, uh, Wait, we never changed to red. Wait a minute. Did I not build on the other window? I did, right? Maybe not. It's not, um, oh, I crashed the other guy just now, but yeah, but, uh, actually, there we go. It is missing data, right? Because when we start sending again some more data it actually fills up from b to c d e and then boom done okay 
which means that it's fried. <laughs> which means I have to save it like this again. Because it's got garbage in it. Butter? Butter. I'm glad I don't actually, don't actually have a way to brick these. Butter. Butter? All right, so then um, why did that not work? Oh, I put it in the wrong place. Yeah, I put this in the wrong place. My bad. It's the other place where we reprogram down here. Yep. There we go. Build that. We gotta th go through the motions once. But, uh, then reset the secondary, and now we should see it turn red when it's actually stopped. Purple, purple, purple. Now it went red. But, uh, so I think when it went red, it coincided with its um, reaching the other guy reaching B and not F. Purple, and... No, yep, it was exactly when this uh, reached sec programming sector B that it, that it thought it, it had sent everything and it started going in its, into its own process, program, um, own program cycle. One possibility could be that, that there is a FIFO in hardware that's 3,000, so um, 12, 12 kilobytes FIFO. There, there isn't a 12 kilobytes FIFO, though. I, look, I was looking at the data sheet, and there isn't such a thing. There's one for the USB, but not the UART. Well, let me look at the UART. Might as well, right? in the data sheet. Maybe there's something to learn from that. I squared C, here's the UART. So it's 32 by 8, transmitted 32 by 12, receive FIFOs. Programmable baud rate generator, async, standard asynchronous communication, stop, start, parity, line break detection, one or two stop bits, five, six, seven, or eight, Bits, programmable hardware flow control, which we're not using. Yeah, I mean, it sta sounds standard. Oh, we can go up to 7.8 megabaud? Hmm. All right, so yeah, the, there is a FIFO, but it's pretty shallow it's only got 30 room for 32 bytes transmit and um i think it's t by 12 receive because there's the extra bits yeah it's only 32 b bytes at a time yeah okay then i must i i, I keep coming back to i must have a bug somewhere where it's not actually sending all those bytes. Oh, drop some frames. Holy man, you updated a VS2022 yesterday and it's been crashing on you so often? So there's a Visual Studio 2022 already? I'm so far behind. The last version of Visual Studio that I installed was 2019. Messing up and throwing catastrophic failures, requiring a reboot of Visual Studio, losing all unsaved work? That sucks. Is it not flushing the buffer to a second? Well, not the last block. See, the problem is I'm, I'm only counting bytes when I get to 4,000. 
those sector sizes, right? So all I know is that the um, secondary board received um, these this many sectors, but it doesn't know where the sector boundaries are. It's just counting bytes as it's receiving them. So it tells me like it's like dropping some percentage of the bytes that it's receiving. That's what it seems like. But yet, when it sends back its messages to the to the um, primary, none of this gets lost. So it's like I got a counting bug somewhere in this code. Size minus offset. And then right now we're just writing all X's. We stop once the offset equals the size. Okay. And on the other end, um, If we actually, there is another piece here. It's here. 64 byte buffer. We call read raw into it. What does read raw return? We get a wood block error if zero bytes are read. If some bytes are read, it's a success. Upon success, we'll return how many bytes were read. So that's the slice of the bytes that were read, and I push them into my ring buffer. This is called from here. So we'll get as many as 64 bytes into the ring buffer, right? And then um, we'll immediately see... Um, that goes to the Rx buffer writer paired with Rx buffer reader. So we'll immediately peek that out, right? Yeah. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. Um... Get the length of the number of bytes there. We'll go down to here and we'll put them in our receipt buffer. Process it. You know what I'd like to do is have a while here. I'm wondering if it's like piling up in there And then our ring buffer is filling up and overflowing. Or something weird like that. I'll just put a wild in there just to see if that does anything. Right now it's all speculation what's going on, but that's okay. Mm. I can program both boards independently at this point, right? Oh, I forgot to reset that other guy. <laughs> but, uh, so we'll have to do him the traditional but, way. Uh, but, uh, Flash. But, uh, okay. Six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, and that's it. But, uh, hmm.
<laughs> that was not it. Uh, another guess. Increase our ring buffer size. So that's set up um, at the very top. Here. What if I double that? Or trip? How about we quadruple it? But, uh, did one side, and I'll do the other side. But, uh, but, uh. Oh no, the cursed uh, connection, connecting uh, pause. What could it be? Thank you for the follow. I'm sorry I can't get this working for you guys. I mean, but at least uh, it's re but, uh, it's repeatable. So it, it must be a logic bug, right? Because it's always at the same amount of sectors. Like, it should get all the way through to F474, right? B but it gets down to B, inside of the B somewhere, and then it stops always at that same spot. Yeah, it's... The same spot every time. Very predictable. So what else could I try? What if I try to send a, an exact number um, that's not 62,580? Like, how about we send exactly up to 8,000 and see what happens? So to do that, the best way would be um, in this, where is it? Next. Um, that. Is it this date? No, it's in forwarding program. This one right here. Instead of size, I'm going to hack it. It's going to be 0x, if I can type in x, 8,000. It doesn't like that. Oh, size equals that. <laughs> Program the bottom one, and then program the top one, and then run an experiment. Uh, really? It's going to get stuck now? It just got stuck a minute ago. Okay. But, uh, and over to this guy. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh Okay, now time to run the experiment. It should only send 
8,000 and stop sending. Here it goes. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, it stopped at five. Wait a bit. B, C, D, E, F. So it's sending a percentage, really. It's like it's losing some percentage of the bytes. Weird. It makes me think that it might have something to do with that fixed size buffer I have um, here. Mm hmm. It's almost 2 a.m. <laughs> Must fix. Must fix bug. Cannot sleep until fixed. Bug fixed. Yeah, I'm running out of ideas though, so I might have to call it and sleep on this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm have to, I think I'm going to have to do that, because I, I really can't afford to stay up until 3.30 a.m. again. I'm going to check in what I have, and then um, try... I'll, I'll sleep on it, and maybe some thoughts will come into my head about what I could try. Probably more logging. Um, probably like sending test patterns and reading them back. Um... I could do short bursts and then make sure they get acknowledged. There's lots of different things I could try. So this is called this will be called work in progress. Uh, getting primary board to program secondary. Push it as it is. Now, did I change my other program? I did. What did I do? I added. I need. I want that checked in, and it turns out that didn't matter. So beep undo beep. that one. I want this one though. Whoops. So this was uh, add program batch file. They call them batch files, not shell scripts in Windows. Okay. You expect a stream at 5.15 a.m.? Yeah, I wake up like four hours later and I say, I know what it is. I must stream again. <laughs> well, if that happens, then I'll send a Discord message first, but probably not. I don't see a Clayman streaming right now. Been there, done that without streaming? Yeah. Yeah, don't really see anyone that I care to raid right now, so I'm just going to end the stream. Um, like I said before, um, I um, probably won't be streaming next week because um, going uh, going somewhere for the week, so I'll be back probably in a week and a couple days. So see you when I see you. Good night, everybody. Have a great day and great evening. Take care. Bye. I'm pushing the button to stop. Bye bye bye. Thanks, for Amy and Dorn, and everybody else. Bye, Kaluta. Bye. See it.